Namaste and good morning to all. This is Rita Lamsal, section officer of NRA. Today again we are in the second day program of web-based seminar on Nepal's reconstructions. Uh, first of all, we will do day briefing. It will be around half an hour program and uh, where we will remind uh, uh, for yesterday's program as well. So without delay, I would like to request um, to the respected CEO sir to cheer for the program and have a seat. Uh, similarly, I would also like to request uh, to the secretary of NRA to have a seat. And again, we have uh, executive member of Dhruva Prasad Sarma sir, uh, please have a seat. I would also like to request uh, Chandra Bahadur Shrestha sir to have a seat. He is also a con conference convener. Uh, similarly, I would also like to request uh, executive member Vishnu Bandari sir to have a seat. And I would also like to request all of other uh, team who are in this studio to have a seat. Now, uh, I would like to request uh, to executive member and also conference convener Dr. Chandra Bahadur Shrest, uh, sir to provide the uh, program briefing of the day. Thank you very much, Ritaji. Respected chair of this session and uh, chief executive officer, my executive colleagues, uh, other all friends, ladies and gentlemen, all participants, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are on the second day of our webinar on NRA's experience sharing um, seminar. And yesterday, I hope uh, it is not only National Reconstruction Authority, but also um, all participants must have enjoyed in a way. Also, uh, maybe, I mean, was useful um, we initiated discourse, and then those discourse, although are are uh, NRA's delivery, but in a way that they are also national level political, I mean the policy level uh, discussions, and then which have very far reaching and long term uh, implications. So we are in a way actually, I mean, uh, initiating discussion to reform some of the sectoral issues. Uh, through this NRA's um, uh, channel. The hopefully, I mean, the discussion yesterday on housing, um, heritage, and public building and infrastructure was useful to all of you. Today, uh, in a continuation of the yesterday's discussion, we have other um, thematic areas to discuss. First of all, we would like to, we will um, uh, present the paper Dr. Vishnu Bhandari, our executive committee member, and also thematic team leader of livelihood uh, uh, thematic team, will present uh, the first time in uh, presentation that is livelihood sector. And then there are two co commentators uh, on livelihood. They are Mrs. Jasmine Raj Bhandari. She is um, advisor in, specialist in uh, Old Bank, Nepal. And she has a long experience in um, the the um, social development sector and livelihood sector. So uh, the Jasmine Rajbandari uh, Raj will be the first commentator. And then second commentator will be Bijay Singh. Bijay Singh is UNDP uh, assistant res resident representative. And then um, he has also profound experience in livelihood and other, I mean, um, sector. So that will be the first uh, presentation that will last around, uh, not around actually, one hour, 30 minutes. It will start from 9.30 and it will go up to 11 o'clock. Immediately after that, we will start the next uh, session from 11 o'clock, that is rescue and relief. Although, as I mentioned yesterday, as we mentioned yesterday, yesterday that rescue and relief uh, is not directly NRA's remit, but we thought it is very, very much interconnected, interrelated issue. That's why we incorporated this. And then for uh, rescue and relief, uh, in, um, our Anil uh, Pokhrel of NDRRMA chief executive will make presentation. And then that uh, presentation will be commented by 
Mr. Lila Mani Pordel. Lila Mani Pordel, I think I don't have to introduce. He was chief um, secretary before, and then recently he was uh, ambassador Nepali, uh, Nepal's ambassador to People's Republic of China. So he will be the first commentator, and second commentator will be Ram Raj Narashima. He is UNDP um, employee. He has uh, he has worked in a number of American relief operations uh, in a number of countries. Similarly, uh, third uh, commentator will be Mr. Bipul Neupani. He is the employee of NRCS Nepal Red Cross uh, Society. So he has also first-hand experience in rescue and relief. After uh, we will uh, we will take lunch break around 12:30. After that, um, we will start another program on governance. That is um, that will be chaired by our uh, executive committee member Dhruva Prasad Sharma, and then it will the paper will be presented by our secretary, Mr. Uh, Engineer Ram Krishna Sabkota, and uh, this session will also last one and a half hour. And here two commentators are there. Uh, Dr. Marco Jemer, uh, he is the chief of EU mission uh, in Nepal. And then next is again uh, Mr. Lila Mani Pordel. He is the chief, he was the chief secretary as I al already introduced in uh, rescue and relief and he will be also commenting in uh, governance sector. And last but not, uh, not the least, uh, we, as I mentioned yesterday that we have commenced one impact study, I mean whether impact is the appropriate road or not that we are still discussing, uh, discussing and then today's discussion will also further enrich a certain which term, uh, terminology will be appropriate. But now until now we have been using the terminology of impact study and then that uh, one team of experts have agreed to undertake our request and it is funded by, uh, it is implemented by HRRP. And uh, that presentation will be made by uh, Dr. Govinda Nepal. Dr. Govinda Nepal was former uh, member of National Planning Commission. He had, uh, he had, uh, he is, he was, he is professor of Trivan University in economics. Uh, and he has, he served a number of different, I mean, uh, institutions, high level responsibilities uh, in various different departments, including Ministry of Finance and other um, ministries. And he will be supported by Dr. Bisho Pordel. Uh, Dr. Bisho Pordel is also quite familiar uh, name uh, 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 in, the, in the economics, I mean, sector. And, uh, and uh, uh, so, I mean, he has been uh, writing number of articles in economic various, I mean, aspects of economics in the contemporary Nepal. So he will be, um, he will be another, uh, he is another member and how they will present, I mean, it will, uh, it will, um, they will determine. And third uh, member of the team is Dr. Suwal. Dr. Suwal was former employed um, director of Central Bureau uh, of Statistics, and he has very good, uh, profound information knowledge uh, in the uh, accounting, national accounting. So he is also extremely, I mean, competent person in um, in, in the national accounting system. So those three persons will be presenting. Uh, we'll uh, uh, presenting the methodology of impact study, how they are going to undertake. And there are two commentators, in a way three actually, uh, that uh, Mr. Kamran Akbar from the World Bank will be the first commentator, and he will be supported by Dr. Nigel Fisher, um, who is also, uh, Dr. Nigel Fisher was assistant um, Secretary General of UN before and he has served a number of countries. Maybe he may have served more than 20 countries in his lifetime. So he has profound international experience uh, in the in worldwide experience in this, um, in this sector. And then another um, uh, economist is Mr. Bishal Thapa. Bishal Thapa is also uh, a com extremely I mean, competent economist and uh, before he served many, um, a number of different international agencies in Nepal, including Department for International Development. He was economist there, senior uh, economist, and right now he has been leading on international company based in New Delhi. So he is uh, another commentator. This is how it will go, and by the end of day we will, um, uh, by, by the end of day we will have, we will sum up.
that's how the whole process will go. Having said that, I would like to um, thank all of you um, participants, all um, uh, commentators and paper presenters. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chandra Bahadur Sreshta, sir. Uh, now I would uh, like to request to the Secretary of NRA, Engineer Ramkrishna Sapkota, sir, uh, for previous day briefing, what we have done yesterday, just for remind. Thank you, Ritaji. <coughs> uh, re respected Chair CEO, NRA, Sushil, sir. Uh, respected convener of the webinar, Dr. Chandra Bahadur Sreshta members of the executive committee, distinguished panelists, paper presenters, fellow participants, media, and ladies and gentlemen. Good morning and namaskar. Dr. Sandra is a convener of the webinar. He has already highlighted the features and objectives of the webinar and the today's program as well, and the webinar protocol to be followed by the participants, paper presenters, and the panelists today and somehow today also. I hope that the ground rules are strictly observed to make this event a grand success. Today, being the second day of, second day, second and the last day of the event from the reconstruction competitive aspect, I would like to have a quick recap of day one's activities of the webinar. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> the first day of the webinar was, in fact, started with an opening session right at 9 a.m. in the morning. And the first session of the program on private housing was started also on time. SAP at 9.30 am is scheduled in the program. The second session was on cultural heritage and the third was on public buildings and infrastructures. All these sessions were started on time. The first two sessions completed in time, however, the third session took a little bit longer than allocated. <coughs> the first session was focused on private housing aspect of the reconstruction and the thematic paper was presented by convener of the webinar, Dr. Sandra himself. The session was chaired by the CEO, NRA, and the moderator partly by secretary, and the latter chair also moderated the session. This thematic paper was commentated by six eminent professionals, namely Mr. Cameron Akbar from the World Bank, with Dr. Nigel Fisher, <coughs> Dr. Yemen Khan from USAID, with uh, Dr. R. Goragai, Mr. R. P. Bhandari from Zaika, and Ms. Maggie Stephenson as an independent expert. Likewise, the second session was focused on cultural heritage aspect of the reconstruction. Work engineer Kishu Thapa chair of the session and Dr. Sandra was the moderator. This thematic paper was presented by uh, DG Damodar Gautam, Department of Archaeology, and Dr. Rohit Ranjitkar. And the commentators were Mr. Christian Manhart from UNESCO, Dr. Rohit Jigasu, ICC Rome, Ms. Gu Kinar. Kieran Drew from Chinese MS in Kathmandu, and Dr. Sudhar Sanaj Tiwari as an independent expert. Similarly, the, the last session of that day, the third session was on public buildings and infrastructure aspect of the reconstruction, which was chaired by the Haram Parajuli, member of the executive committee, and moderated by SB Dr. Sandra. This thematic paper was presented, presented by four gentlemen, namely Mr. Bharat Arial, Joint Secretary, NRA, in general, and Dr. Yuvaraj Powell, Deputy Project Director, CLPIO Education, with you know education infrastructure, Mr. Amrish Sirsta, DPD, CLPIO Jimali on public infrastructures, including was sector as well, and Mr. Raju Neupane, Deputy Project Director from CLPIO PIU building on public buildings. This thematic paper was commentated by Mr. Lu In from Chinese MSc in Kathmandu. Mr. Krishna Lamsal from Zaika, Dr. Yaman Khan with Dr. Arjun Kodala from USID, and Mr. Puna Kodaria as an independent expert. After the third and final session of the day, Dr. Sandra briefly described the takeaways from all the three sessions, and then the secretary put his remarks, and finally, the respected chair at around 5 p.m. summarized the discussion, thanked the paper presenters, panelists, and participants for their active participation and then close the day once activities of the webinar. That was a brief outline of yesterday's session. Here I'd like to note that the papers were thought-provoking and relevant, and the discussion on thematic papers during the time allocated was participative and easily accessible to the users. In fact, each theme was looked from the variety of dimensions, like challenges and issues that the NRA has faced, 
strategies and approaches that the NRA has adopted to respond to challenges, lesson learned during the process, and the key messages drawn from the whole process of reconstruction from that theme. For me, as reconstruction practitioner, I think this is the most important aspect of this webinar. I must say that the discussions were well organized and questions and issues or concerns were basically arranged on chat box. Panelists were so keenly involved during the entire sessions and supplemented the paper presenters to further strengthen the concept and thereby the outcomes of the presentation by providing them critical comments, suggestions, and feedback. Paper presenters were requested to note the comments, suggestions, and feedback provided by the panelists and commentators and the participants and fine tune their papers before submitting to the ICNR Secretariat for the proceedings and other forms of publication. Finally, I'm very excited to be a part of this webinar and greatly privileged to participate in this important event. Important. Having said this, I wish you active participation in today's program as before. Sorry, sorry. Have a good time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Secretary, sir, uh, for a brief outline of yesterday's program, and it is the reminder for all of us. So uh, now, um, this is the second day program, uh, as all of we know already. So I would like to request uh, the Chief Executive Officer of NRA, uh, Engineer Sushil Gewali, sir, to provide the opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Ritaji. <coughs> thank you very much. Uh, 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 respected Secretary, uh, our executive board members, uh, and all the participants uh, who have been participating in this uh, program through the virtual means. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, and uh, we are entering today, as uh, just mentioned, that uh, the, for the second day of our, uh, the presentations in regards to the compendium uh, that is being developed in the NRA, and uh, to receive the views uh, and the feedbacks from all the, uh, the uh, national and international audience and the practitioners who have been engaged in this reconstruction process and also the experts around the world. Today, it's uh, just mentioned from uh, the, uh, Dr. Chandra uh, Badur Sreshta, uh, the convener of the, of the, uh, of the conference, uh, and also by uh, our secretary, uh, uh, Ram Krishna Sapkota, that uh, he also highlighted uh, uh, the, the yesterday's program and the, how it went, and also uh, uh, briefed about the, the, uh, the program for today. And the, uh, in this regard, I, I hope uh, 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 there will be very, very lively discussions today. Uh, actually, we are providing the opportunity for all the participants to uh, participate through the question answer uh, and the chat box uh, provided uh, uh, in the in the in the in the box uh, in the in the in the lap in your laptop on the computer, and that can be uh, provided and the shared uh, uh, the, and the and the organizers and the commentators or the paper presenters they will be responding uh, your queries and and the suggestions, and that will also be recorded, and the uh, uh, the especially in the economic recovery uh, uh, I think. Uh, the, uh, in the reconstruction, we have made a huge investment. Uh, uh, the, as per the, uh, the program of the NRA itself, the, the investment uh, uh, that will be channelized or mobilized through the government of Nepal uh, itself is the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the 4.8 billion US dollar. And, the, uh, uh, and the similarly, uh, till now, the, the total investment that has been made is 3.18 billion. Already uh, up to the last fiscal year, uh, this US dollar, that means 318 billion uh, rupees has already been investment, invested in the, in the reconstruction. That means, uh, and at the same time, we are also mobilizing uh, the almost uh, the around 1.25 billion US dollar uh, from the uh, from the different uh, these international agencies or the turnkey projects or the different NGOs and INGOs sector. Uh, that is the general sort of assumption that we are, that we are making, and we are going to have the actual sort of the investment that is being made from the international development partners and also the different uh, INGOs and the NGOs through the out of the government treasury. And besides that, there are there is also the huge level of investment also being made by the private sector as well, by the house owners themselves. That means there is a huge level of this the sort of investment and the economic uh, sort of the activities have been, uh, are, is being taking place uh, in the reconstruction process. That means there is, it has created a huge number of employment opportunity for the people. 
as well as the, the contribution in the, uh, the uh, GDP as well, that the, in the economic growth of the country as well. So uh, that's why there is also a need that we have to dig out to what extent the, the economic benefit or the social benefit has been delivered to the people, how the people have been benefited out of this reconstruction process as well, and to what extent that we have been able to, to, to focus on the economic recovery and the livelihood component of the, of the, to the people directly through the different programs or indirectly through the different set of the reconstruction programs, uh, programs which has created the economic opportunities for the people. So that will also be analyzed, and today that will also be discussed, I think Dr. Vishnu Bhandari uh, has uh, uh, this is going to make a presentation on that, uh, uh, and then the, we'll be getting the receive the, 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 the feedback and suggestions from all the participants. And the second aspect is uh, actually uh, in the social dimension. Certainly, the community-based organizations have been mobilized. The users' committees have been mobilized. NRA has given the importance for the uh, concerned house owners and the community themselves so that there will be the small scale of the infrastructure will be managed by themselves or will be uh, constructed or the uh, this, uh, construction management will be made by themselves so that the larger uh, sort of the number of the, uh, this employment will be created and uh, the people will be benefited out, out, out of that. And then I would like to recall that this, uh, this almost 70% of the total school reconstruction is being managed by the communities, by the school management committees. This, uh, there are a the large number of integrated settlements is being managed and the constructed by the community, community themselves. There is also the huge number of the community infrastructure that is being managed by the, by the community themselves, either the small scale water supply project or the environmental management projects that is being managed. So that means the community mobilization is also there. That the, the, there is a certain level, the social cohesion has also been created through the process of the reconstruction. So there is also the social sort of the recovery is be, has also been enhanced. Uh, this actually, the community cohesion is one of the major component of the of, of uh, Nepalese uh, these uh, local communities, and that is being enhanced through the process of the reconstruction as well. And in regards to the governance, uh, I think uh, the uh, uh, there are many, many, many more lessons that has, that we have also learned. Actually, Nepal's reconstruction cannot be uh, uh, this uh, considered uh, in isolation. There is a need that we have to think the context that we uh, we are passing through the challenges that we, are, we have encountered that are also to be, to be considered. Uh, if we look into, if we recall the, uh, the, the, the situation when the earthquake hit the country, hit the country at that time, the, uh, the country, the nation was in the process of the huge level of the high level of political debate in the formation of the constitutions. And we have been able to promulgate the constitutions. In between, from the unitary state, we have been uh, this, uh, converted our country whole, the governance mechanism into the federal setup. And there was a devolution of the powers, human resources, and the financial resources to the different levels of the government. And that has had the impact to the, to the, to the, to the reconstruction process as well. And the, we are also the, the, the difficult geogra geographical terrain that we had. Yesterday's uh, this, uh, the discussions and the experts, they have also highlighted that Nepal's uh, reconstruction, uh, especially housing reconstruction, was one of the largest in the world, but at the same time, one of the difficult in the world as well, I if we look into from the, from the, the terrain, the geographical terrain that we have. And uh, these, the, the, also from the capacity perspective, that was also the huge level of the capacity enhancement that we had to do uh, as compared to the other developed countries. So in that regard, the governance was uh, really one of the major challenges uh, and the, the results that we have achieved. Uh, at, at this time, we are talking that we have been able to, out of almost 800 houses, uh, 800,000 house, uh, households, we have been able to reconstruct uh, almost around 92% or the almost in the completion phase of the 92% of the houses. That means it is uh, really one of the major achievements. We are talking the schools of almost around 800,000 schools and then we have been able to complete already 80% of the schools already been completed. So th that means the, the, the reconstruction sort of the tax that we are talking about, the progress that we have been making, it is a huge and then we have to evaluate uh, our whole governance mechanism also from this perspective and then in this regard I think uh, we are also having a different level of lessons either in the political arena, the political consensus that we have made uh, through the advisory council, through the steering committee where the opposition leaders and the, 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 the ruling party, these uh, the leaders, they are all sitting together, coming to a consensus, giving a feedback and then the driving this, uh, this reconstruction process as well as in the district level, all the member of parliamentarians, all the three levels of government are sitting together and coming to a consensus and then uh, giving the direction to the to the reconstruction process in the district level so all the government agencies have also been coordinated in the different levels 
if we look at the HUD board itself, we are also having the different level of the professionals in the different background, and then the, we are also working uh, together and, and then uh, coming up with a certain level of the, uh, results with the professional uh, set of the expertise also, uh, these, the feedbacks and the expertise is being utilized. And then if you look into the, the, our uh, these partners, especially the development partners, they have also given the space as in the, the legal set of mandates, uh, uh, in, uh, the mandate has also been given to them through the DSCFC, D Development Assistance Coordination and Facilitation Committee, where the, our development partners are being participating, uh, private sector are participating, and also the uh, INGOs and the NGOs are being participated in that, uh, also with the government agencies together. That means this is a sort of the kind of the, the, the uh, sort of the coordination that we, uh, we are making. That means in the governance aspect also, we are having a lots of experiences which we can share to the world and also also uh, these uh, suggestions can also be received in this uh, in this regard and then we are also under the process of handing over or the phasing out of the RNRA into the new institutions and the RRME and the concern level of the government and the in the regards to the rescue and relief uh, this uh, there are also lots of experiences that we have also gained and this uh, on this uh, the uh, uh, the there is a need that this the, the how to uh, this manage the emergency operations uh, in the in the in the in the situation of the disasters that uh, also the knowledge that has also been gained uh, in this in this in this uh, in, the, in the process of rescue and relief uh, after the, the 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 earthquake and then for this purpose NDRRMA is also being established which is also under the process of establishing the different operation centers up to the local level up to the world level up to the community level I think so that is also to be enhanced and then on the basis of the experience that we have we can enhance the the emergency operations in the future and the and the finally uh, the the sessions that uh, today we have is the NRA's impact study we'd like to know the the uh, actual set of impact though it is this has not been the time for uh, for coming up with the com overall impact of the reconstruction it will take more time uh, this uh, to look into the impact also in the outcome level but uh, the, the 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 certain level of the economic sort of the uh, sort of the economic opportunity that has been generated especially in the um, GDP, especially in the employment, or in the different aspects of the of the of, of the life of the people, uh, that we would like to also look into uh, during our tenure as well. That's why a uh, 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 highly uh, high level of expert team uh, have been commissioned for this purpose, and then the, they are also under the process of the study, and they will also present, uh, I think, in today that how they are going to make uh, this study, and then what sort of approach that they are taking, and then they will be will be having the opportunity to also provide our feedback uh, for the process as well, uh, to, so that we'll be having that is study uh, much more better, and also result uh, will be result oriented. I would like to say, so um, uh, this I will not take much time. So uh, I would like to welcome uh, uh, you all in this program. Uh, the and the today's event, uh, there are four different sessions which uh, Dr. Chandra has al already mentioned today. Uh, this uh, just now. And the and the I would like to uh, express uh, my uh, I will also be the full time in this in this program. Uh, I will be observing and I will also like to also give my feedback and suggestions from my side. And the and then I would like to also hear actually from the participants what they are thinking about the about the reconstruction progress that we have in these different areas. And then the with this I would like to thank you all. And then the wish all the best uh, for the today's program. And then would like to invite you all. Uh, of the participants who are um, this uh, this uh, hearing and then observing through the video or the uh, difference of the means of communications today and then the um, actively participate and also have the lively discussions lively discussions would not be possible direct sort of the discussions but we we'd like to make it live because in the chat box or in also in the question and answer box you can put your uh, your views or your feedbacks and the queries and that will be uh, this uh, uh, responded by the concerned commentators or the paper presenters or in the certain areas the nra side as well so with this uh, this i would like to thank uh, for the for the uh, and also all the organizer and the secretary team. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, very much, respected CEO, sir, uh, CEO, sir uh, for your valuable opening remarks. So uh, we have uh, concluded here the opening session of today's program, and now we would like to move to another session, which is the presentation session. And as you have already know that the first uh, presentation 
uh, is on livelihood and economic development, which will be presented by Dr. Vishnu Bhandari sir. So for the second session, this presentation session, I would like to uh, request again to the CEO sir to chair for this uh, presentation session. And also I would like to request to moderate the session uh, to the Dr. Chandra Bahadur Shrestha sir. So, uh, I want to hand over this floor to again see you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Ritaji. Uh, uh, welcome again uh, in this program. Uh, and the, the first session, as we have just mentioned, uh, this session is the, uh, the session uh, under the name of the livelihood and economic development, uh, the economic recovery, actually. And the, uh, I would like to uh, request uh, uh, Dr. Chandra uh, to, to, to moderate this session. Thank you very much, sir. Once again, welcome uh, on this very important, extremely important, I mean, session of livelihood and economic recovery. Uh, this paper, as I mentioned earlier, will be presented by Dr. Vishnu Bhandari. Dr. Vishnu Bhandari has a huge, I mean, a, a, at least I think 40 years of experience in this field. Uh, he was, uh, he started his career from Rampur uh, Agricultural College as um, associate as, as a lecturer there, I think I'm correct, lecturer. And then he, uh, well, he went up to the certain level of um, corporate ladder in Rampur College. After that, uh, Rampur uh, um, Agricultural College. After that, he joined a number of different um, international agencies like EC Mode as well as IUCN and various different other organizations. So he has long experience, he has brought long experience of in livelihood sector. Uh, and he's, he has um, PhD from um, uh, you know, American University. So he has long experience and then since five years we are working together and he has been leading livelihood um, thematic area in uh, our executive committee, um, executive committee since very beginning. And uh, similarly, I would like to welcome uh, Ms. Uh, Jasmine Rajbandari. Jasmine ji, are you there? Jasmine ji? Yes, good morning. Yes, good morning. Namaste. Namaste, Jasmine ji. And uh, I would like to introduce also Jasmine ji, uh, Jasmine and myself actually. I mean, we worked together in the Department of International Development long time back. I was in infrastructure sector and Jasmine ji used to be social development advisor there. And then later on, Jasmine ji joined uh, World Bank. And now uh, you are social development specialist there, aren't you? Uh, exactly. Social protection. Social Sunday. protection, <laughs> yes, exactly, yeah. So um, Jasmine is anthropologist from her academic background, and then um, uh, she has long track record actually in this field, and then she, uh, she has published a number of publications actually from the World Bank. So um, welcome, Jasmine. Welcome. And the next commentator is uh, Bijay Singh. Bijay ji, are you there? Yes, sir. Good morning. Thank you very much. And Vijay ji is uh, assistant resident representative in UNDP and Vijay ji has also long I mean, track record in this field, development field as well as particularly his particular interests are in the social development sector. So uh, we are, uh, this session is really I mean well equipped in terms of I mean presenter as well as um, commentators. Uh, uh, without losing more time, I would like to request uh, Dr. Vishnu Bhandari to make his presentation. Your time is 30 minutes, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Svesta, for my short introduction. Mr. Chairperson, and ladies and gentlemen, today I am going to discuss on what we have achieved in the field of livelihood in reconstruction. Livelihood is a cross cross-cutting area as stipulated by the PDNA, PDNA, the Vedas of Reconstruction in Nepal. That means it is connected to each and every part of reconstruction. Any change in any part would change the whole system. That is why it is, an, in fact, stipulated as cross-cutting issue or interdependent areas in reconstruction. 
after the, rec after the PDNA, we developed Reconstruction Act of 2072 and followed by the National Reconstruction and Rehabilitation Policy and of course the fourth generation document, what we call and which is our master doc another master document, PDRF. So all these, they give high priority and the most emphasis, emphasis is given on livelihood. It's not only income generating activities, but in all aspects of this thing, making, meeting the basic necessities of those affected by the earthquake. So under this background, we have developed this paper on a three assumption. One is that, and I feel personally, that reconstruction is itself a livelihood process. Because in a total budget of household, house, when, you have, when, you, when people are making, building their house, in a total budget, about 20 to 30% is directly spent on employment generation. That is, you know, labor, this thing. In the second, second rung, again, let's see, we need the bricks, we need cement, we need rod, we need zinc, we need what we don't need, we need everything. They are also produced. So uh, in the second round, you know, let's take about the bricks. It's also prepared by the, built by the people. So the third ring will be like a services. So that is why I think that livelihood reconstruction itself is a livelihood process. The second thing we assume that our target is the earthquake affected people. And the third one is that our livelihood activities, whatever we do it, has to be in the earthquake affected area. So this is because of this thing, we, we, are, we, are, we have developed this thing. So the devastated earthquake of 2072 is really, you know, the, it devastated Nepal, physically, economically, socially, and even even, even as a, you know, physically, socially, economically, psychological, even emotionally. And, uh, you know, affecting, yes, affecting 32 districts of Nepal. And uh, 5.6 million, you know, I mean, I mean 2.8 million households. This is the PDNA thing. 94 million work days, they were, they were lost affecting this thing. And, you know, we can say that, you know, like uh, there was a, Seven, almost 75,000 workplaces completely damaged. So can you imagine what was the extent of damage and causing the loss of 171, 171 million US dollar? That means 171,000, you know, thousand million Nepali rupees. So this was the situation. Now during the past five years, what we did, in the past five years, the most important thing I would assume is that we have been able to generate the work days of 166 million. That means if we roughly calculated, we can employ, we have employed 36,000 people for one year. This is the rough estimate. And you know, then during this period, we also, what we did was we also did a, we also trained 77,000, you know, machine workers. The machine works, when I say machine, it's we are using in a holistic term. Electric fitters, plumbers, carpenter, rod bender, painters, all kind of this thing. So 77,000 people were trained on this by this during this period. And this was done with the help of our all line agencies and partners. They were almost 182 partners. And uh, in terms of women, you know, like, uh, you know, sex, distribu uh, sex distribution, almost 10% were women. And uh, this training has broken the stereotype that mason is a male-dominated work. Now, a woman in a odd country, odd village, earning 300 rupees a day, now is earning 1,000 rupees, along with her male partner. So this is a dramatic change. Of course, there are some changes that I would like to say later on. But also on this thing, I would like to say that basically the masons are from various different, different various ethnic groups. And it is all over the 32 districts. 
So, and this was, uh, I would like to say one thing that very important thing done by one of our line agency, Department of Archaeology. They say that, you know, they collected the masons, they identified the people, they've identified the location, and then they started making up, you know, like uh, making, making, restore the things. For example, in Gorkha, Pandit Pauwa, this was the burning example of how they Department of Archaeology doing on the masons. This came together. One of them was a Nike a leader, and one of others where they were making a preparing a drawings. They were discussing the materials, and they prepared in seven days Pandit Power of Gorkha. It is a very good burning example. Anybody can see it. So it's a very good thing that we've been doing. The another thing is that we have a cash, you know, cash distribution. In the cash, cash for work scheme, wonderful scheme. One was the cash distribution. Like our partners, have, they have a uh, uh, partner organization, they have uh, distributed three billion billions of rupees, but there were conditional cash. They, if they uh, affected people, they prepare a map, or um, plan, or if they, prepare, they, they say they have a, some kind of, uh, completed some kind of construction work, they were given a cash. Or they had a, you know, like a, they work good, they go to and the community infrastructure work, and then they, they get money, and that money they can use an, anywhere. That was the thing, you know, this is the thing. Then there was a, you know, kind of a seed money, and also there was a revolving fund. So this sort of way, you know, it's going on, it was doing through community, community cooperatives, and local government. So in this way, our partner organizations, our line agencies, and all others, they were, you know, successful to, they were successful to, they were successful to reach out to 4.6, 400, 4,600,000 uh, households in the earthquake affected area. That was the, this, this is the, you know, this thing. And then there was a material distribution kind of thing. You know, our line agency, they distributed uh, something like, uh, you know, uh, uh, mini tiller, uh, thresher, uh, then, then you can say that, you know, corn seller, uh, uh, this, uh, what you call uh, irrigation gears, uh, remedial, you know, agricultural inputs, veterinary medicines, hybrid goods, you know, you just name it, they have distributed very successfully, and it was a very, very good thing, and they have done it. Another thing that we did is also the direct inter intervention. For example, I tell you, put there, you know, uh, they have bid the many, more than 1,000 plastic ponds. They have a poultry and sets, you know, this they have distributed, uh, they have a built a river training for protecting la landslides, and, uh, you know, 300 water resources they have already restored. So there were many things, like 42 roads, they were like 600, you know, in, in length, they were constructed under line ministry direct intervention. So in addition to this, there was a JC program. The JC program was a, a very good and in, in order to reach out to the people in a fair and equitable way. Uh, they have a, a, they applied vulnerability criteria, they have a CGI groups, and they have a, you know, a community building funding, you know, like in Gorkha, uh, in, they have a number of uh, uh, revolving funds uh, uh, designed for the people for, uh, people for, uh, people with, uh, living with, uh, um, you know, disabilities. So, and also they have a, you know, commercial farming. One of the important thing that they were also able to pick the, the right person. For example, Sukumaya uh, Maji of uh, Kavre. She was handicapped. She lost her hand long, long ago. And her daughter was, uh, uh, what are the visibly uh, disabled, what we call blind. And then her uh, son, uh, uh, sister-in-law, she lost, she was, she broke her, um, she broke her back at the time of earthquake. So the partner organization was actually picking up the light person and they were, you know, trying to kill three birds, three birds with one stone. Although we say it, two birds, two birds with one stone, but our partner organizations were able to kill three birds with one stone. Likewise, there was a psychological disorder. Immediately after, after the, this thing, after the earthquake, you know, some people, they just got disorder, have a disorder and uh, in depression and she, the, the lady was crying, and there was, she was crying, she was weeping, all the, she was disturbing the whole system, and the psychological, psychosocial uh, projects helped them, you know, uh, to guide, give, give them counseling. So that was the thing, and also, you know, uh, there was domestic violence also. So in livelihood, JC sectors was completely, in, in fully involved in this kind of section. Next, please. Now, having said this thing, I like to say that we had uh, some challenges and issues. 
For example, the NRA itself is a, is a you know, NRA itself is a, uh, you know, in a, in a, in a institution designed for a fixed period of time, means under the sunset law. That means our organization was not as equipped as others. And we had a limited resources. We had a fixed time. That is why we said that that is because of this thing. We had a very good example, but we had a very good had, had, hard time to see this. How can we replicate these good examples? So this way, I can say that there is a replicability, and there was a market forces. Market forces was, was, was also a very difficult thing. Of course, the line agency, they did it, case studies, outcome of intervention. And the most important thing is that how to, how to give continuity to the, this 77,000 people. That was the basic thing. And that is what we've been doing. And of course, in the bank, there is a money. There is a guideline. The affected people need the money, but there is a, there is a gap. They, at the end of the day, the affected people are not getting any loan. Only 200 people, they have received, received this loan, subsidized loan. And only 5,000 people, they have received the commercial and agricultural plan. And what about this thing? So that was the problem. How to simplify this thing? They were the issue for us. And how to continue? And uh, how to continue these things? This is also the problem. And in the beginning, as you know, we had a problem of this, you know, trained, you know, manpower, you know, lack of skilled manpower. So we, our uh, livelihood program or the whole reconstruction process was a bit, you know, late, uh, a, bit, a bit delayed, but we were trying our best. And one of the things I would like to say that uh, in uh, integrated program, we had to see uh, the, the livelihood at, at three, from three perspectives. At the time of origin, at the, time of, at, at the place of origin, at the place of destination, and socialization. So for those who are, who, are, you know, who, who are supposed to be located, for them we had to see in three aspects. First phase, second phase, and third phase. So these are the, some, of the, some of the issues and challenges we were facing in our destiny. Next, please. Now, what was the, the, the strategy that we, we used, approaches, whatever we call it? I think one of the things was that, you know, we used the labor-based construction technology or labor-based intensive, um, you, know, you know, approach. Means we wanted to give employment to as many people as possible. We wanted to use local resources, local skill, local, you know, local knowledge, that was the thing. And then also we wanted to see quality is mixed. We, we are make sure that quality is this there. And also we had to, you know, we had to do to give a training. That was the one is done one strategy. Uh, you know, that was the, that was the thing. So we, as I said that earlier, we also gave a training to our training to our masons. We gave a training to our technicians. We take, gave a training to our mobilizer. We take, we gave a technician, we know, uh, uh, training to our even our staff, so that we would equip in a way that we meet meet the target or the mission. So that was the thing. And of course, as you know, we have been giving special support to the vulnerable groups and marginalized groups. It was discussed yesterday. Also, we also discussed today. Our main intention was that no one should be left behind. Of course. And uh, this strategy, or through this strategy, we try to use the government line agency. We try to use as many partner organizations as possible, grassroots organization. I tell you, in training, in, in, our, in our livelihood, there were 47 uh, organizations. They were full-time involved, and others were also involved. And these 40, 47, uh, um, 47 uh, partner organizations, they involve on an average seven grassroots organizations in one place. So they were not only bringing money, they were not only procuring money, they were not only working with the people, they were also developing the capacity of our grassroots organizations, and that is what this thing. How this is, we were successful. One of the example is that, one of the example is our NGO guideline. The NGO guideline is it's a very good, uh, I think that, that has bind us together. One of the thing is that we had the partner organization, they had to have an agreement with the NRA, NRA and the line agency, 
and then, then partner organizations. So there was a mainly to avoid the duplication of resources, manpower, and all these things. And uh, you know, they had to do public hearing, social editing, and uh, out of their total budget, only 20% were supposed to be spent on, the, uh, on their logistic thing. That way, you know, we were successful. I think this NGO guideline was the basic document, the Vedas for building all this, these um, uh, NGOs, uh, donor NGNC, partner organization together into the field of this thing. Next, please. Now, with this thing strategy, I would like to say what are the lessons learned? Lessons learned. You know, I think livelihood, you know, it should be uh, linked right from the beginning at all level of this project, you know, re reconstruction, recovery and construction process. I think this is the key thing. I think it has been proved universally proved things. And another thing is that cooperatives have been the best means for people's access to market and this thing. So you see, this is, this is, the, this is the thing I, I will tell you later on also. Another important thing that we felt was the, was the, was the lesson is that understanding between the, between the project, you know, we understanding between the different stakeholders who are directly involved in the project. If that is the transparency and the accountability. If there is a transparency, if we are transparency, if there is accountability, I think things go, will go all right, even if they think wrong. So this is the, what we felt is that very good, the foundation of our uh, your, your collaboration and cooperation with our partners. And disability, you know, disability, many people think in a different way. And sometimes they are overprotected. Sometimes they are overrejected. So this is the key issue. You know, this is the key thing in the, market, in, the, in the field. But it is a right issue. It is a development issue. It is a health issue. And I think that's where we need to go and we need to do. I think uh, we, we, we have to go, you know, in a, in a dignified way. That is the thing. And government and... Uh, Private organization, both are important, and government, wherever government reaches, sometimes the government cannot reach out to those places. There, the private organization, the private sector can go because of, they have a, a flexibility, and uh, they have a flexibility, and they have a, that kind of mechanism. Next, please. Okay. Another good example, I said, Cash for work, I mentioned it. It has been appreciated by all. And uh, this is a good, good thing. Uh, they have a different modalities. Not that it is a dist free distributing cash. You know, it's not uh, like a free distribution. But uh, the cashes were distributed for a specific purpose with uh, some designated procedures. That is why it was appreciated. And uh, marketing was a problem you know, in marketing also. Local indigenous methodology methods like a hot bazaar kind of things were very good because they were first had a direct contact between the producers and consumers. And the second thing was that consumers were, were able to get a fresh thing, fresh vegetables or fresh things. And then also at the same time, they were getting the things cheaper because that has boycotted, you know, that has, you know, superseded this uh, um, uh, middleman thing, middle person thing or wholesale thing and kind of this thing. So that way, uh, there are many opportunities, you know, this thing, and we have already given uh, vulnerable groups to special, special help. Uh, and uh, GC has been a very good, you know, for, uh, for fair, equitable thing. And we were not only concerned with the women, but we were concerned with, uh, you know, geographically isolated people, those seniors, those Sikh, uh, those, you know, people with the other, you know, different type of sex type of thing. And uh, that kind, that way, you know, Jesse was a very good, I think that has been a very good source of reaching out those people where we were not able to, uh, where we are not able to reach in, you know, in ordinary way. Next, please. Now, conclusion. I think based on our findings, based on the data and information we have gathered, our, our consultation with our partner organization, line agencies, and even ourselves, I think we have received the, uh, we have been able to achieve maximum output with minimum resources. And there are many good examples, many, many good examples, many models, but they are on a small scale how to scale up them, how to diffuse them, how to, you know, this, you know, how to roll out them. I, I think this is the thing we need to discuss, you know, that is the thing. Because we have a plethora of good examples. And these were, how to use those good examples for our purpose is, is a question. And it takes some resources, time, energy, and everything. 
as I said earlier, that uh, tripartite or collaboration, collaboration between among NRA, line agency, and was the best. That is how we were able to mobilize our partner organization. Of course, there are still some shortcomings, uh, but uh, despite those things, this has been a very good thing, and that is our conclusion. And uh, of course, uh, marketing infrastructure, everybody talks, talk about, everybody talks about a marketing infrastructure, but this is how? I think need, we need more, more support, more, more research, more action research needed to develop a marketing structure and these things. Of course, livelihood benefited, you know. Livelihood is not only benefited from income generating activities only, but a total reconstruction and recovery process, of course. And uh, JCs, we have already said it. And uh, economic recovery, as you know, it takes time. Sometimes you get, a, you know, you know, flatly, you can get immediately, but uh, it takes time. So we need to wait for some time and see how this effect of this thing on the real life situation. Next, please. Now I'm con con concluding my, this thing. Like to us, to us and based on our information, livelihood is sustainable when it goes with the marketing. Beekeeping in, 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 uh, in, in Cabre Polanchok. The beekeeping, there was one partner organization, they did it what, they identified the people. They, they identified, they gave training, and they produced this thing. They, they trained, they gave training, and also they gave a beehive when they left the training. They started producing honey, and that honey was purchased by the cooperative, their cooperatives. So they didn't have to worry. So that's why now it is sustainable, you can see. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's in near the uh, Saga village. Anybody can go and see. That's a wonderful example. And of course, uh, when people are sharing, cost sharing, mind sharing, or even the resource sharing, that becomes you know, a very good thing, and that is ownership is the thing. And of course, rural people, rural people, they are always, they always diversify. If you go and see in a kitchen garden in rainy season, you see there are 10 types of vegetables, like, you know, pumpkin, you know, pumpkin, uh, as, as, as pumpkin, then gourd, rich gourd, snake gourd, pointed gourd, so many gourds, chili, so many things you get it, because that is the, a good example of diversification. Tripartite uh, collaboration, I already said it. And most important thing is that partner organizations, they have conducted the end line survey, after the, after the project is over, they, uh, they conducted the survey and they come up with these things that, yeah, yes, sir, we, yes, we have achieved 70%, 80%, or 90%, because that is what data said, that is what information said. So, inline surveys, or inline survey, or post survey is a very, very important thing, and that is what it needs to be done. And of course, the livelihood program is very, very successful when we give them some kind of skill, material, incentives. That is what I've been doing. So at the end, I would like to say that construction and livelihood should be married. Many people think that reconstruction is only construction. No, construction and livelihood should be married, and only then we can see the good result, sustainable result in the future. And second thing is that I would like to say that in anthropology, because of Madam Jasmine Bhandari, Raj Bhandari is an anthropologist. We talk of you know, two perspectives. One is a emic perspective and ethic perspective. Whatever we have gathered here is a you know, ethic perspective. And now we have to go and see what is the emic perspectives. Some of the good examples I have already given in the paper, and that is a good emic perspective. So emic perspective and ethic perspective both, I think, give us a conclusion that livelihood program under the NRA has been success, successful to the extent it has a resource available. And we, we have been very successful in gathering, garnering the support, uh, wholehearted support of government agency, NGO, INGO, donors, community agency, community organizers, community CBOs, and all partner organizations, including the NRA people. So I like to especially express my gratitude to the staff of the NRA who helped us gather this information and the, PA, uh, and the line agencies who were, despite their own, own hassle, they were helping the earthquake-affected people. And of course, the partner organizations, 
they were not only procuring things, but they were doing the things on the ground, and as well as they were trying to, they were really empowering the local organization that is a uh, grassroots organization. With this thing, uh, Mr. Chairperson, I would like to include my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. It was perfectly on time. Uh, well done. So, uh, I learned actually this terminology, uh, Jeshi, from uh, Lean Bennett at that time and then also Jasmine Ji actually. They educated us <laughs> about JC and uh, its concept of terminology. So having said that, Jasmine Ji, uh, your comments please. You have 10 minutes time. Uh, thank you so much uh, to NRA and to Chandra Ji. As Chandra Ji said, we have a, a long work history together and I think have influenced each other. Um, so today um, I am extremely uh, excited to be here, partly because I was also involved in the PDNA development um, and also in the early design of the World Bank's earthquake housing reconstruction project. So fantastic experience and opportunity for me to also learn um, so many years later what the achievements have been um, in terms of NRA's efforts um, as well. I also would like to appreciate the difficulties I would say uh, taken on by our presenter, Dr. Vandari, because it is an extremely comprehensive review that he has provided. And I'm very aware that there is a uh, a very vast limitation in terms of uh, data, particularly around impact on livelihoods in Nepal and most vulnerable people's livelihood. Um, so first a minor comment and then I'll move on to my more substantial comments. Um, I think the distinctions made in the chapter around cash, uh, cash support, conditional cash, cash for work, uh, need to be clarified a bit more. There seems to be a bit of a mix up in terms of the concepts. Um, that being said, I'd like to focus on three uh, key themes that I, I see in um, the review and I would like to see perhaps more of, shall I say. Um, one is around fragmentation, uh, the second around really the most vulnerable, um, and then the third around economic resilience of the vulnerable. So let me start with the fragmentation. Um, so clearly so much happened and so many stakeholders were involved. Um, and as we heard also in the presentation, as an example, there was an organizational guideline for NGOs. Um, and I recall that uh, in the development of the PDNA, the chapter on employment and livelihoods had suggested a um, comprehensive strategy because livelihoods is so interconnected and holistic. Um, and I would be interested uh, to see more on whether that strategy happened and if it did, how we compare uh, the results we see today in terms of livelihoods, because obviously there are many, to what would have been in that strategy or what was in that strategy. I'm aware that there were um, sector plans that looked at livelihoods at um, different stages. So the short-term strategy, the medium-term strategy and the long-term. Um, and again, I wonder whether um, if, if this chapter could be presented um, looking at uh, a framework of those three stages, uh, whether it would help us in our learning because clearly we see a lot around the short-term, the skill development, the training, um, the targeted sort of interventions to particular sectors, productive sectors. Um, and we see a little bit around the, the medium term. Um, but I do wonder, and I, I would think it'd be very interesting to look at whether in the, the part of the longer term strategy around diversifying livelihoods and diversifying employment opportunities, really to the level that these households that were so um, highly affected um, are now more resilient um, and would have an ability to really recover in the longer term. So um, a suggestion that maybe this framework would be useful for the chapter. Um, the second area that I would like to focus on uh, is it's very clear that as with many other government initiatives, um, the Jesse perspective was taken on extremely seriously uh, by the NRA and, and these um, activities that were taken on. Um, I do wonder though within that, because again, uh, Jesse covers such a vast group and it is not a heterogeneous group. Um, if we could have a little bit more focus um, on the most vulnerable. Um, and as an example, I know there's quite a lot on women, but perhaps not a lot on informal workers for it uh, as an example. Uh, and here I have uh, a few suggestions perhaps, some of it uh, perhaps more, toward, uh, more for the lesson learning area. Um, being part of the World Bank, I'm aware that uh, there was support to do a comprehensive uh, uh, survey data uh, soon after the earthquake. Um, and I'm aware that there's a management information system. So I do wonder whether, despite the lack of um, evidence around impact, whether the um, use of this administrative data, the use of the data collected through the survey, 
some further disaggregation of what already exists in monitoring could be utilized to strengthen this evidence for the chapter, particularly around the most vulnerable. Because um, I think the, the anecdotal evidence that's there, those examples are fantastic. Um, but we really need to show, if we can, the scale of that impact, which is where perhaps the administrative data could be useful. Um, the second area, and again, this goes back to the most vulnerable. So I'm aware that there was this um, Jesse vulnerability criteria that was developed later with the idea being that there'd be additional support uh, to the most vulnerable. Um, I think top ups, maybe 50,000 um, or so were planned and perhaps even provided. Um, perhaps it'd be useful in this chapter to further expand on this type of support uh, for the most uh, vulnerable. Uh, to really show that across the board, there was such an effort made and it was, you know, how um, those that were extremely vulnerable amongst those were um, earthquake affected uh, did also receive um, support. And if possible, obviously how that support really panned out in terms of an impact on, on the livelihoods of those particular individuals and households. Um, so the third area, and this comes um, also back to the work that I'm presently involved in, um, is really the identification. I know this was extremely difficult and, and there's a lot of um, politics and a lot of issues around uh, potential social uncohesion when we focus on, um, on uh, particular groups of people. Um, and I think, you know, looking forward as well as looking back now, one of the key things that Nepal needs is really having an integrated social registry. So the social registry is really an integrated information management system with geographic, demographic, socioeconomic data of households and their members, and it's linked to an ID. Um, and this can be linked to program beneficiary databases. And what that would mean is that the whole idea of a comprehensive approach, an integrated approach, would be easily monitored as well, um, but also it would also be easy to know across all of these many programs, um, whether it's the same people benefiting, for example, whether a particular household received 15 different um, uh, uh, supports or schemes, and one household received only two. Um, this type of thing is also useful looking forward, so part of the lesson learning. Um, if in the future there is, <laughs> fingers crossed not, but again, we are living through another disaster. But in the times of disaster, being able to more quickly and easily identify um, the most vulnerable. The third area I want to quickly focus on is really the idea of economic resilience of the most vulnerable. Um, and a lot of this is really thinking around employment support and thinking holistically in terms of both the capacity and the resilience of these households in terms of future risk. Um, as you, many of you may know with the World Bank, when we talk about sort of jobs, we focus on three things, the quantity, and obviously a lot of that is reported on here, you know, the number of days uh, that, of employment that was generated, but also the quality, um, which is also about the productivity of that. Um, and access. And I think a lot is mentioned here and the Jesse talks a lot about who was able to access this. Um, so in that, um, along those lines, I would say uh, one quick point. Uh, it'd be interesting to also provide evidence if it's possible, not just of the cumulative number of days generated, um, because the, the evidence around what happened uh, post earthquake, 94 sort of million, the number quoted in terms of uh, affected uh, work was large. But we also need to look at annually what happened as opposed to the over five years cumulative. Um, second, I would say um, there's, it's very clear there was a big focus on skills training and employment opportunities, but it does seem a lot of that was um, for low skilled jobs. Um, and when we talk about people's resilience, there is this idea, I, I do think it was there, I, I'm not sure, but if it was, it'd be great to highlight this further, this idea of skills plus, um, and the idea of helping people move up the ladder through the opportunities that they have have, um, giving them that um, capacity in the long run to be in a slightly better position in terms of finding better opportunities. Um, and then I think um, it would be really interesting again to look at the disaggregation uh, of the most vulnerable and looking particularly at who received those opportunities, which is fantastic, but also identifying who we were not able to reach. Um, and that would help us explore what we could do better um, and be better linked um, and useful in terms of looking um, at the future um, and how we could have more lessons learned from what we have been successful at and what our challenges were. Um, I know there's a time constraint, so I am going to conclude now. Um, very much I would like to thank Dr. Vishnu and the NRA for reiterating the important messages, particularly the one about the need for having a holistic response when it comes to having sustainable livelihood changes 
and the link through employment opportunities. Um, I think as Nepal goes forward and as the development here um, uh, continues, I think things that the government is already doing now, such as having employment service centers um, and the work that the World Bank is supporting under the Youth Employment Transformation Initiative will hopefully in the long run mean that opportunities and choices around employment and improving their livelihoods across Nepal, both in the times of disaster response, but also in the longer term um, are really things that can improve uh, the lives of the most vulnerable. Um, I will stop here um, and thank you very much for the opportunity. I look forward to further engagement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jasminji. It is, uh, you highlighted very uh, important issues actually here. This disaggregation of data and then uh, making sure that the really um, my targeted beneficiaries, whether targeted beneficiaries are really getting benefit out of it or not. Uh, what was that? I mean, we have to produce evidence there. And um, the criteria, I think, I mean, the, I remember while we were developing criteria for vulnerable, we went through a long discussion, actually, what would be the appropriate criteria to identify for identification of the vulnerable groups. Uh, that discussion, uh, at a time, we took something like administrative type of decision. Okay, this is what it is. Uh, but I mean, uh, that our decision may not have satisfied all of the donors as well as, I mean, uh, NGOs as well. Um, so, I mean, that discourse uh, is still continuing in a way, uh, this way or that way. The, whether economic vulnerability has to be also criteria that has to be reckoned to. Uh, that, is, that is still, uh, that protracted discussion is there. Administrative discussion is resolved. But, I mean, theoretical conceptual discussion, discussion is still continuing. And how to, the identification, you also raised this identification and registry of vulnerable so that they can be pointed out very, um, uh, within a uh, very short period of time after the disaster. That is also a very important point. Let us have discussion. And uh, I would like to request all audience, actually, to uh, have quest prepare question and then post to us through chat box. And uh, we'll go back to our paper presenter, Dr. Vishnu Bhandari, as well as commentators. If you have any question, I would really encourage you to do so. Uh, having said that, I would like to move to um, Vijay Singh Ji. Vijay Singh Ji, I mean, uh, your time now. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chandrasekhar. Uh, uh, it is a great opportunity for me to uh, to participate to be a panel uh, of the economic recovery session, the economic recovery livelihood session. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Um, Mr. Vandari, for giving us a very comprehensive uh, summary of uh, what was done and uh, and what we are challenged. And I also agree with the points. I also agree with the points uh, that Jasmine Ji has highlighted. <clears throat> uh, let me give uh, uh, my insight on on this. Uh, I think when we talk about uh, economic recovery, uh, I think there are two things coming to mind. One is the macro picture of it, how we see, how we see it at the macro level, and then another is uh, the micro side of it, what we really see, what, what actually makes sense when we go to the community, when we see the community, whether it has really improved the livelihood or not. Looking at the macro picture, I see that um, uh, the data says that the GDP was increased from 1.1% to 4% uh, in the fiscal year 2017 and 18, immediately after the earthquake. So it is a clear indication that improvement in the GDP has contributed to the livelihood improvement. And then the second is uh, the reconstruction expenditure was substantially increased in the consecutive year in 2015, 16, 16, 17, 17, 18. So, and it is out of the total government expenditure, the reconstruction expenditure has gone quite high. And then, uh, during the reconstruction time, the sales of the construction materials has gone up. So it has created, uh, it has also contributed to, uh, to the livelihood of the people. Now, this is a very macro picture. I know it doesn't capture everything. It is very difficult to, very difficult to quantify it. What was the real impact in terms of economy? <clears throat> But when you look at the, at the micro level, and I agree uh, what Dr. Vishnu uh, presented here, uh, that the, the, the livelihood aspect of reconstruction, though we, though we realize that it started very late, because it took some time for uh, NRA to come up with the livelihood strategy, to come up with its own livelihood policy, and then started the livelihood-based interventions. 
I think the much more focus was given in the beginning on the reconstruction of the houses. But I agree with what Dr. Vishnu Mundari mentioned that the, uh, the reconstruction of the houses was also very much linked to, though it was not planned that way, but it was very much linked to uh, boosting the livelihood of the people. I think, uh, and the reason is the approach that we're taking, the owner-driven approach, uh, uh, the, the using the local materials, using the local machines, using using the labor-intensive approach of reconstruction. I think that was very much responsible to that. I, I fully agree with that. Uh, the training, the, the number of machines that we produced, it was tremendous. The training to the different uh, training to the different groups of people, which were used in reconstruction process, was tremendous, and that actually built their livelihood of it. But again, uh, the point I want to make here is. Um, when we talk about livelihood, uh, the livelihood is a lot of lot of things that relate to. So it is a cross. That's why I call it is a cross cutting. It is a socio. It is a psycho socio recovery. It is also linked to that. It is a. Uh, it is. Uh, it is also linked to uh, how we protect the people because we have seen that uh, during the after even after the earthquake when when pe when people were engaged in building the houses, they were also suffering from other sort of disasters, like uh, the floods, the landslides, that used to happen still. We have seen the last year, last year monsoon and also the year before. So I think um, livelihood protection means that also we make a strong link of disaster risk reduction into the livelihood approaches, so that the approach that we take now, it also ensures that the people are resilient to the future disaster. And it is very much linked to the, building the economic resilience capacity of the people. Because people cannot afford uh, fighting to the uh, people cannot afford fighting to uh, the other sort of disasters like floods, landslides, and others, which I've seen. Uh, another thing is, I think uh, um, it was very much used uh, in the case of reconstruction in Nepal. We know that uh, the grant given to uh, the house owners to construct the houses was uh, three lakh rupees per houses, but we realized that it was not sufficient enough. And then the way the people will go to get the additional money, which was the, it was supposed to be from the banks through the soft loan, but that mechanism didn't work. That Dr. Vandari mentioned to it. So the only way was uh, the people had to go to the private lenders and get money, get money on a high, get money in a high interest rate. That would have put, or that it has already put the people, the house owners, into a dead trap, which has largely impacted their own livelihood activities because whatever they generate, whatever whatever they would earn income in the future has to go to the pay to the, uh, they have to use it to pay to the lenders. I think there are certain examples which where uh, I think, uh, I, I think we work better in case of Nepal. There are certain examples like uh, we try to, be, uh, try to create a revolving fund mechanism, which was not in all cases, not in all 32 districts, but in certain cases, uh, I think it worked very well. Uh, the people were benefited from the revolving fund. They, they, took the, they, took, they, they took money from the fund, they used it, and they returned it back. So it helped to save them. I think in future also, uh, in future also, we have to consider that one aspect of livelihood is creating jobs and employment, but another aspect is how to save people uh, from getting into the debt trap, uh, which has high cost for them to pay in future as well. Another aspect of livelihood, I think, is uh, Dr. Vandari captured very well, uh, and I also believe that, that that was true, though it is very difficult to account it, uh, but it was very true. Uh, livelihood is just not related to um, making, uh, increasing the number of requirements uh, or increasing the income at the household level. Of course, it is the main uh, aspect of it. But then the infrastructure that was damaged, the bridges that were damaged, the roads that were damaged, the irrigation facilities that were damaged, it goes beyond the household level. So it requires a community approach or, or, or the whole village approach has to be there. I think that part was done very well. Though it started late, but I think through the line agency, through the development partners, uh, through many other organizations who have been working on uh, reconstruction, as well as on the as well as on the livelihood recovery, they worked very well. And that, I think, that, that actually helped to build the livelihood of the people. Uh, the people got connection from one village to another village, given the given the difficult terrain that we have. Uh, 
the roads were fixed, uh, the bridges were made, and I think this helped a lot, even in the reconstruction for the transportation, for the transportation of transportation of the materials, and also uh, it also it also helped to boost the businesses. I think that uh, that must be considered uh, in our case, and I think if you, and when we talk about uh, integrated approach, and Dr. Dr. Vandari mentioned about it, I think it is very important that when we talk about integration of livelihood, then all of these things come together, saving the people getting into uh, from getting into the debt trap, uh, building the infrastructure, the community infrastructure particularly, which plays a very important role uh, in building the livelihood, uh, and all those things. And another important thing is, um, which I say it was very much important, the inclusive nature of the livelihood. I think we, we have some models, we have some models, we have some examples which has, we, saw, we saw that how inclusive the livelihood approach was utilized, but I think, of course, it was very much fragmented, was very much scattered. We don't have a uniform picture of applying the same model of using the same examples everywhere in 32 countries, in, th in 32 districts, sorry. So, but I think there are essence of that. Uh, so that also worked very well. I think uh, this should be documented. Now, when we uh, when we look at uh, when we look very closely that what happened there, I think uh, immediately after the earthquake, the people have lost their livelihood. That means that they have lost their jobs, they have lost their businesses. So the main so the focus was on how to revive the businesses that were lost. Uh, uh, the micro to small enterprises, uh, a lot of a lot of other informal economy, a lot of other informal businesses that were going on, the vegetables, vegetable farming, and all that that was lost. So the first focus was how to revive them, and I think there again it it we don't have a very informed picture of it. It didn't work very well in all 32 districts, but in many cases it worked. So the support that was provided by the development partners to revive those businesses which were lost. They came up. Again, the question is, I agree with that, the question is of scalability, the question is of replicability, given the time concept that we have, but it came up. So it also indicates that when we uh, link the livelihood package with the reconstruction package and the question of marrying together, I think it worked very well uh, in this case. So the livelihood started recovering uh, when we walked on, when we rightly identify which businesses were left, which businesses were lost because of that way, and we try to push them. So I think it kind of an incentive package that was provided to us effective. Then the another aspect of livelihood was creating the new businesses. And I think here also, uh, the, here also we have a different stories from the different districts, from the different communities. But I think if you take it as a lesson learned, I think it worked. Many new businesses cropped up like uh, making the block, making the bricks, which started at the local level. Many development partners work on that. It engaged the people. It, it, also, it also employed the people, so it, it contributed to the local economy as well. But it, as a business, it started growing up. The timber processing, that also started growing up. The furniture making business, is at the new uh, Sorry, there, there, there is some echo there, uh, sorry. Uh, sorry for interrupting. Extremely sorry for interrupting. There is some echo uh, that's, that is not making uh, very clearly. Is there anything you can improve from their side? There is some no noise. Side, uh, sorry, sound is coming. Maybe some other microphone might be open. Uh, from my side, I'm fine, sir. Please go ahead. Please go ahead then. I mean, sorry for interruption. Yeah. That's okay. So, uh, so I have mentioned. Uh, that the new businesses, it also provided an opportunity to create new businesses, to grow new businesses. And those new businesses actually worked. But again, uh, it was not everywhere. We don't have a uniform picture of growing those businesses everywhere. But at least it indicates that uh, as, as it was assumed that after the disasters, big disasters, there are opportunities for, uh, for, for, for growing the new businesses. And I think uh, in, in our case also, uh, it, it happened. It happened in some cases. Now, when we talk about the challenges, and I agree to, uh, agree to what uh, Dr. Bhandari mentioned, I think the challenges that we face is of uh, scalability and the replicability, because we realize that the, uh, we realize that the intervention uh, related to the livelihood was started a bit late. Uh, I think uh, after two years of the reconstruction, we started looking at uh, the livelihood aspect of it, because it took a lot of time uh, to reorganize uh, the package of the livelihood itself. So I think uh, the, the issue of scalability and the, and the replication 
was an issue. The issue related to uh, the targeted support to the different groups of people, particularly when you talk about inclusive recovery, uh, the people with disabilities, the, the woman-headed households, uh, uh, the people who are really economically marginalized, and how to provide uh, support to them. And, and I think uh, there are the mixed, uh, there are the mixed uh, success of that. Uh, I have seen some examples uh, from the UNDP projects that we have been doing. Uh, the support that we provided uh, to recover, uh, to revive the agriculture best uh, livelihood. I think it was mostly, it mostly goes to those who have possession of the lands, possession of the lands, but those who were landless, we could not intervene much onto that. So I think that aspect of inclusiveness has to be looked at. But again, the targeted interventions, we, we found that uh, it worked very well. The, the people with disabilities, uh, they were trained in making, uh, making, the, making the furnitures of uh, the bamboos, uh, and, and they were very much involved into that, and, 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 and they find it a very specific niche area for them to get engaged into. So after some training, they, they really were able to uh, start the businesses. Uh, the women very much were involved in agro best businesses and, and they worked very well. The poultry, the goats, uh, goat farming, the buffalo farming. I think it went very well uh, from our experiences. So the include, inclusiveness nature of uh, the livelihood, if we really identify the options, opportunities for the niche, uh, for a niche product, for, for a very targeted, uh, for a very targeted social group, it really works. But when there is a mismatch, it doesn't work. It, it doesn't go further. But again, the, the question is of uh, question is of scaling it up. Uh, the, the support was provided to the buffalo farming. Then it has to be linked with. It has to be formed in a cooperative. Then it has to link with the uh, putting of the dairy plant. So that that is that is the second stage of uh, second stage of the business promotion. Another is the market market link and all that. We found that. During the reconstruction itself, uh, the several uh, several communities were able to put uh, uh, able to start the businesses and selling the construction materials, and that was something where the whole community was engaged into. Again, it didn't work uh, in all districts, I would say, but in many areas it worked. So the people. Sorry, uh, Vijay ji, could you please start concluding now? <laughs> Sorry for interruption. Yeah. It is going so nicely. Um, start concluding now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll come to that. So the point I'm trying to make is the community businesses that started uh, in the villas, uh, that, that reduced, uh, I mean, that helped the people buy the construction materials locally available in their own villages. And it also boosted uh, the businesses in the village. In conclusion, uh, I have three points to make. One is uh, the targeted comprehensive approach is needed uh, for recovery. So the construction as well as the livelihood recovery has to be uh, quite integrated from the beginning. Second, the livelihood is just not about uh, counting the number of employment that has been generated or the income that has been produced out of it, but there are a lot of other things related to that, which, which means that protecting uh, the people going into the death trap, uh, protecting the people from other forms of disasters, investing into building the community structures through plays a direct role uh, in the livelihood enhancement, like um, the bridges, uh, the, the agriculture roads, and all that. And then very much targeted interventions, which is needed, which is very, very specific to, uh, specific to the different groups of people, like the people with disabilities, the, people, the women, uh, those who have some business skills already, they need to establish that uh, things. And the last point is, uh, we realize very much that uh, and I think it is a learning for future as well that we need to start the livelihood uh, implementation or livelihood best interventions uh, from the very beginning. And, and for that, it requires uh, access to finance, access to cash. Cash for what worked very well, but the access to f access to finance a very important aspect is very important aspect of livelihood, and that has to be uh, built from the very beginning. So that's where I'd like to stop. Thank you, Chandrasekhar, for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Um... You really triggered very fundamental I mean, issues around livelihood, how the, this type of reconstruction initiatives be linked with other generic uh, developmental initiatives, as well as um, how the preparedness initiative has to be linked with the reconstruction 
uh, process and then what happens after the, after the um, reconstruct after the disaster uh, you, you linked actually also i mean linking livelihood with community infrastructure linking livelihood with targeted intervention a lot of i mean um, buttons you have uh, touched so this this is very good i mean very much i mean um, highly thought provoking uh, we have also received questions from the chat box before going to the chat box, could you please, uh, Dr. Bhandari, you address the commentator's I mean, question, and then I will come back with the chat box question. Uh, five minutes. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator. First of all, I would like to give my thanks to two commentators, uh, Madam Raj Bhandari and uh, Dr. Singh. I think uh, I haven't really heard all the things uh, very clearly, but uh, I would l like to say that uh, we will, I will try to incorporate all those things you have already said in this thing. One of the things that uh, Jasmine said was the holistic response to reconstruction is a, is a very good uh, approach. I, th I think that is what we've been doing. And you have clearly mentioned honestly mentioned the, that uh, your involvement in, in PDNA. Yes, you have in PDNA has clearly said uh, three things uh, in, in, in relation to livelihood. One is short term, immediately on agriculture, tourism, industry, and things like that. Second was this, in second stage, mid term was this involvement of private sector. And the third one was the like long term involving the whole society. Uh, thank you very much. I think we will do it. Uh, of course, yes, we, we, are, we, are, we were not reinventing the wheel. We were building on the success of what the line agencies and our partner organizations were, we had already done it. So that's what, that was the key thing that I would like to tell you. And as regards the vulnerability, we have a clear, you know, this thing that uh, people above 70, you know, 70 years old. And uh, then we also said that people living with a, a disability, like they have a red card or blue card, you know, kind of this thing. And the third one was the child-based household. So we clearly identified and we tried to reach out those people. That was what we did it because of the time constraint. Of course, there were other things, but uh, as our moderator said, it's for administrative purpose. We did it. I don't know to what extent we were success. Uh, we were right, but we were successful for the purpose. We this has been created. And uh, another thing that we I would like to say that you know one of the study that we also built on this UN woman conducted one study just at the time of just we were initiating and they were starting in three districts on this uh, um, JCs and women thing. So basically, we also took into those those things and we we did it. So that's why these are the things, but thank you very much, Madam Jasmine. Uh, your points well taken, and we will also incorporate this thing. Uh, Dr. Singh, uh, I think uh, you have a, uh, oh, also, Jasmine Ji, this uh, social registry is a good idea, and we will do it, but I don't know how we will be able to do it, but I really support your ideas that there should be some kind of integrated study. Uh, now, Dr. Singh, I think um, uh, you have a lot of pragmatic experiences and uh, you know, pragmatic experiences that uh, livelihood and uh, these two things should be, you know, clearly, uh, clearly they should be married, you know, blended. Like, uh, you know, in a blacksmith iron, if we go there, they, they, they just rasauni, uh, it's, it should be go that way. It's, it's, we should not be biased. Oh, this is the engineering aspect. This is social aspect. This is economic. Everything is, is linked. Like we are talking about basic necessity, you know, food, water, uh, you know, health, education, all these things. So I think I fully agree with you, this thing. And uh, livelihood approach, you know, loan, uh, that is the problem, you know, you know, you know, here. As I said, mentioned in my paper that, uh, there is a money, there is a provision, but people are not getting. And they are in turn, they are going to the you know, local lenders and uh, paying a usurious amount of interest. So that was the problem. I think we need to do it. And of course, scaling up is a problem. Uh, I agree with you. Uh, you said access to finance. Uh, I also like to, I said uh, that uh, it should be like a, a market also. So, but uh, thank you very much. We'll also incorporate your this thing as we get it from this thing. Thank you so much. I have been really enlightened by the comments and suggestions and advice that you too have given to this paper. It will be very, very useful for us to polish this paper. Thank you so much, Madam and Sir.
थैंक यू वेरी मच बिजनेस सर देर आर सिक्स फोर फाइव सिक्स सेवन क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम दिस चैट बॉक्स द फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज फ्रॉम दीनानाथ भंडारी एंड सेकेंड इज विजय बज्राचार्य थर्ड इज शांता राना यूनोप्स एंड सुमन बायलकोटी एंड युवराज पौडेल शांता राना सी केम बैक अगेन एंड विजय बज्राचार्य दिज आर दी क्वेश्चन एक्चुअली वी हैव रिसिव्ड and the first question you may i think it is not necessary for me to i mean respond you just uh, go through scan through them and then respond uh, appropriately bola koti ji ko chain uh thank you very much uh, for these questions uh, dinanath bhandari ji bandhu uh, and vijay uh, bajracharya santarana and suman mobile koti okay thank you very much i have uh, these four questions I'll just uh, read in detail, but I would like to tell you three. Dinanaji, we have given the season. When we go to agriculture, it's a season is the most important thing. We don't want to. We don't. We never went there to tell them to teach them that wheat in the Sraman or Badra or Baisak Jet. We went there in you know you know Mangshir. So in uh, always we are trying to reach out to them in the right season so that they could learn. They could, we could show them, and also we can learn from them. You know, so it's it's a two-way process. If we miss the season, that is not the practical thing. So we were always going into season. Another thing is that the, you know committee committees are everywhere. You know the committees are not responsible. Mainly the it is an administrative unit that is responsible. Committees are supposed to be making the policies also, and they were giving advice and suggestions and direction. But it is the implementation. Implementation. So committee. I. I personally, uh, it is a very important part. But I don't believe that they really Im go to the ground and implement it. So committee is only advisory committee. Vijay Bazar sir, result on JC will be important. We have a results. I will. We will put some on that th this thing. If you like, we will be showing you in a NRA thing. Uh, Santarana uh, confusion about top of service. There is no sir. No confusion. Uh, I mean, in, if we, if you are qualified with the three criteria, we give them fifty thousand. But due to some process, if the affected have not received it, then we would like to expedite it. But there it should be no confusion. Once they are identified, they will get it. Of course, time will take place because from here to go to the ground district and district to uh, palikas and palikas to ward ward to real places that will be difficult. But that that is the thing, and. Uh, uh real ball never got a benefit i think we have got it only that if we have not been reached out to the with the resources that's a, another thing but as much as possible as far as possible with the limited resources i think we have been able to reach out to the most of the poor vulnerable, vulnerable as well as the real vulnerable people i think uh, this is what i would like to say but uh, i will definitely go through it in detail and try to uh, give you more concrete answer later on thank you very much Uh, the additional questions are uh, another is Yuvraj Podel. Yuvraj Podel asks that uh, is it possible to initiate construction-based industries uh, so that that will ensure longer-term livelihood issue? That is the one question from Yuvraj Podel. Should I go all other also? Second is Santa Rana from Yunops yes, uh, regarding top off of the additional support vulnerable as many uh, they have not received it. What is uh, NRA's view on this? third is vijay bajracharya uh, he says uh, the he asks question about the analysis of uh, various different construction technology yeah. that will that will help uh, for generating employment opportunities three additional questions please yeah, yeah. okay thank you very much i think uh, uh, mr porel uh, construction based technology is possible one uh, one of our partner practical action they have focused all their activities on construction based technology that was first they say that they compressed you know bricks they they try to big lead that's as a alternative things and they have made a you know um, aggregation center and they have tried to do it so it is possible and uh, it is possible but it takes time it takes long term you know uh, you know like a homework is is possible uh, i think santarana i i have already uh, i have already answered your question uh, Yeah, here is a how have you analyzed in terms of construction technology for long well i think this the, uh, there is a problem i mean sia 
or EIA, we haven't been able to do it. But what we have seen that the direct result of the, the activity that we have received, we have seen. That is, we have done this thing, and based on this thing, we can say that it can be further expanded. But still, on a, to go on a large or massive scale, I think there are many, 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 you know, tests it has to go through. SIA, social impact analysis, environmental impact analysis, climatic change, and uh, it kind of things, we need to do it. I think this is a good, we have had a good start, but to go on a massive scale, I think we have to go through the many, you know, you know like a test, and that, that we need to do it. I think that's, that's it. Uh, thank you very much, sir. I think you responded uh, to the, to uh, our commentators. Uh, could, is it possible for you to also write those, your very important uh, comments, and then send to us, to secretariat, ICNR secretariat, so that, I mean, the, those uh, important issues which should not be forgotten. I particularly requested um, Jasmine ji as well as Vijay um, ji, so that, I mean, we can record uh, properly. Uh, we have taken note, but it, there could be some omission. Uh, that's why I requested you to do so. Uh, hopefully, I mean, uh, you will find it uh, easier. And uh, the second issue is there are a number of um, uh, people who supported Dr. Vishnu Bhandari to prepare this livelihood um, paper. And then he, I mean, he synthesized, analyzed, and then presented today. Is there any uh, person, individual behind who worked in livelihood uh, thematic team and then would like to supplement, comment on the whole process until now? Is there anybody who worked in livelihood uh, thematic team and would like to respond? Seems not. So uh, if that is the case, actually, I mean, uh, NRA, we are going to initiate, I mean, some another livelihood project. It is a bit, we are in the two light stage right now, but still, I mean, we are trying to initiate one project. And uh, I would like to request highlighting that proposed in intervention, uh, our CSR will be able to do that. And also, I will conclude this uh, session. I would like to hand over a uh, microphone to you, CSR, both interve intervention, proposed intervention, and then uh, taking forward and concluding whole session. Over uh, to you, sir. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Sandra. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, uh, first of all, I would like to thank, uh, actually, uh, to the paper presenter, Dr. Vishnu Mandari. Uh, who have been able to to uh, have a comprehensive set of the outlook uh, of the overall uh, uh, livelihood and the economic recovery activities that the NRA has launched, uh, and the special set of the program that we have thought uh, he has highlighted, uh, I think, is the threefold and the one certainly uh, the uh, certain level of focus program uh, launched through the government agencies. Secondly, one of the major approach that the NRA has uh, has taken was through the partner organizations. Uh, the POs or the NGOs as on the basis of the three uh, sort of tripartite agreement that we have made uh, with the concerned NGOs and the local authorities and also that uh, the, our DLPIOs and the central level agencies and the NRA. And the, and the third approach uh, certainly was integrating the, the uh, livelihood opportunities into the overall reconstruction program itself, either in the housing, designing the housing program or the designing the, our local infrastructure program or the different other social infrastructure program while implementing uh, this thinking uh, to develop the employment opportunities for the people, uh, this increasing, enhancing the, the, the entrepreneurship sort of the, the, the sort of schemes by the people they themselves. Yeah? Uh, the, these are the, the efforts that have been made. So uh, this is a really good uh, uh, presentation that has been made. And then I would like to congratulate Dr. Bhandari. And uh, at the same time, uh, there were some of the sort of the feedback and suggestions have been uh, provided by uh, our commentators. Uh, this, uh, I first of all would like to uh, the, uh, congratulate and also would like to thank uh, to both the commentators uh, from the World Bank, uh, the Jasmine Raj Bhandari. Uh, she has made uh, the very, very uh, briefly on the three sort of the aspect that are also to be looked into. Uh, by the by the paper maybe i think the our thematic team and the and the, uh, uh, the dr bandari will be looking into this that is one is the, the the fragmentation of the program itself and to what action it was there and then the how it was uh, just uh, been been possible to to come up with the results this uh, the focusing on the vulnerables and then the how was that uh, the address 
and the and the long term economic resilience uh, sort of perspective how was the program that we have designed and then the uh, these results that have been achieved uh, in that uh, the context uh, i think uh, the the compendium uh, during the preparation of the compendium i think we have to have a more analysis on the mis from the perspective of the jc and also from the perspective uh, of the of the different vulnerable uh, sort of the groups uh, this how was the the uh, sort of the, our efforts uh, that have been made available to them and then the how was it effective i think that is another one uh, sort of the point that i have noted here that would be better to to go ahead and the secondly the top of grant and then how, to what extent was it useful uh, from that uh, sort of the angle also we will also be looking into uh, in the compendium that uh, this uh, this uh, more analysis to be made and it's in this regard there are i have seen also the the queries also here from the bj bazar and also from santa rana from the unops uh, and the uh, different agencies here actually uh, in this regard what i would like to mention that the, the top of grant in the housing reconstruction was provided to the people who have been recommended by the local governments by the local representatives there is a system that we have designed any any people who have been uh, this recommended from there and there certain criteria that has been designed the, by the nra these all sort of information have been sent to the local governments and the, on the basis of the recommendation by the local governments we have been providing on that and if there is any left uh, i think uh, the uh, this you know inops area or any sort of uh, other area that we have noticed you can uh, this uh, this uh, give the feedback to the nra also and the one of the idea of, uh, from jasmin ji that uh, i liked very much uh, that to establish the integrated social registration system is very very vital and the people who have really uh, received the, the benefit uh, by the government uh, through the program and then the uh, to what extent that has been coverage has been made i think in this regard we uh, certainly need to have the enhance this uh, sort of the system and then there is a need to establish this system that is really very very important and in there is also the suggestion that there is a need that the annual work days are to be analyzed and then they will have to find out these the, how the people have received the employment i was just making uh, during this time of the, of the presentation um, that the dr vandari was making that uh, when you are talking that 166 million work days have been generated uh, through this uh, through this uh, the program if you look into this uh, the, end, the annual basis i was calculating calculating that if 120 days uh, have been for for one year uh, this for annual basis 120 work days have been designed for one uh, sort of the uh, the, you know, the uh, employer or the persons, then it, there will be a uh, sort of the estimation of around 350,000 uh, sort of the people would have received the employment for 120 days a year. That sort of this, uh, this, uh, this sort of the um, calculation that I was just making while you are making the presentation. That means if you look into, let's say, around 800 rupees a, uh, a month per month, uh, a, a day that the one uh, sort of the labor will be receiving, in, uh, in that situation, almost one lakh rupees uh, per person uh, this, um, uh, this annually they are, they are receiving. And then these numbers goes to around 350,000. I think if we, there is a need that we have to also look into this uh, from the effect, uh, actual basis, and this will really be very, very good contributions uh, from the side of the, uh, from the perspective of reconstruction. And, and then the, how we can continue in the future, that is also an uh, agenda also that we have to think about. And then there is also a need that we have to uh, revisit, uh, revisit the criteria that was defined for the vulnerables and then the how was it effective and then the how was it covering uh, to the to the most vulnerables that as that we have we are thinking we have thought through to target uh, maybe uh, that we also have to think about uh, these uh, these uh, suggestions from jasminji is really very very valid and then we'll certainly be uh, be looking into while uh, finalizing this company and document in these aspects as well we'll be able to to analyze on that and the, um, it is uh, really important that uh, that the employment service center that is going to be established by with the uh, the World Bank uh, program, especially in the employment uh, uh, generation sort of the, uh, this uh, program uh, that uh, that you are going to launch, the government of Nepal and the World Bank is going to launch. Maybe in this program we certainly have to think uh, from the all these vulnerables uh, from the DRRM uh, disaster risk management perspective. So I just would like to also request to you also just to think. Uh, the, uh, the the in this program also uh, how we can really link on the disaster risk management and in this regard we can also would also like to also uh, sit together with you uh, with the world bank team and then the and the program team and then the would like to also provide our feedback in this regard 
Vijay Singh uh, from UNDP, uh, you have uh, you have been engaged uh, very closely uh, with us uh, in the in the in the uh, in the housing uh, program as well as in the different recovery and the reconstruction program. And then the uh, your sort of perspective uh, to look into this economic recovery uh, from the macro as well as the micro level uh, sort of perspective is very very valid. And uh, the macro level, uh, we are uh, certainly looking into uh, the analysis is being made through one of the uh, the team uh, led by Dr. Govinda Nepal. Uh, the former, uh, the member of National Planning Commission, and uh, and uh, and the uh, and the other team, they are also looking into. So uh, this one study has been commissioned to them, and they will be coming up with the with the, with the uh, sort of the economic impact uh, this uh, that, that has been uh, this uh, this uh, uh, been uh, left uh, or the, uh, provided uh, through this reconstruction effort, and that will certainly uh, will also be able to provide our feedback and suggestions on that. In the micro picture, uh, this um, the. Uh, the housing reconstruction has boosted the livelihood opportunities. Uh, thus, your observations is also very, very valid. I think uh, that uh, has uh, really been analyzed by um, by Dr. Bhandari also. And the uh, this uh, 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 this another point that you have raised that this the the debt trap, uh, whether that has uh, been in that level to the people or not. Uh, you have raised that the, the government was providing 3 lakh uh, uh, rupees as a subsidy, 300,000 rupees, and the people were using around uh, this year. You have to spend uh, almost 10 lakh rupees. So how this sort of, uh, this, uh, the rest of the amount that being, uh, being, ut being, uh, being, uh, being uh, utilized or the, or the beard by the, by the people, the house, concerned household themselves. So uh, I think our impact study will also be, uh, for, will be will be also looking into this aspect as well, and then the, I think we have to provide the feedback to the team, and then what sort of impact is there, and then then we can suggest to the government in the future that how uh, these if there are certain sort of issues related on that, how that can be uh, this uh, this uh, be addressed in the future. Uh, uh, one of the another aspect I think this in this e study also that we also have to have a questionnaire in the random while make, have making the random sampling I think the secretariat and the team uh, they may also have to look into this is the livestock and agricultural sort of this uh, loss that we had in the past and how what sort of the li this uh, livelihood sort of the uh, activities that the people are conducting at the moment and then the opportunity that they have created at the moment and uh, what was before the earthquake and what is exactly at the moment with the people I think that is that aspect is also to be looked into and then it will also provide the, the sort of the, uh, the overall framework to us how we can go ahead and what what we can suggest to the National Planning Commission and uh, other government agencies uh, especially the government of Nepal in this regard and the uh, another point I think that is very very important is the access to finance is very important and then we have to think uh, it in the uh, from the very beginning of the reconstruction and recovery that is uh, really a valid point in this regard but I would like to have uh, I have uh, my own observations in this regard actually uh, the uh, the NRA tried its best to provide the opportunity to the to the earthquake uh, victims and the earthquake affected people and the government also agreed on that and then we made uh, the guideline the integrated uh, guideline on the soft loan was also uh, been uh, announced and while also been enacted and then implemented as well but um, the uh, the uh, uh, there was a very less number of the people who wanted to utilize this money and then they come up with the, with the banking system and then the uh, um, the, and then the, uh, there was a gap, I think, uh, of uh, having a linkage uh, of, the, of the people who are really a needy one uh, with the banking system. So there is a need. I think it's not only that the government didn't provide the opportunity. Government provided the opportunity. There was, an, there, was an, uh, there was a sort of the fund that is being made available, but that was not possible uh, to be, uh, to, to be uh, this, uh, the accessed by the people themselves. So what is, the, what is the reason behind that? Uh, I think in my view, one of the major reasons is that the people don't know about the procedures, about the information, uh, about the, having the link with the, with the, with the constant financing institutions. So there is, uh, in this regard, we had also discussed in the past with the World Bank team, uh, also to design the program uh, this, uh, the, for the overall economic and the livelihood sort of the recovery program also to be designed in this in that regard we had also certain sort of the fund was also uh, that we thought that to be mobilized uh, but later on it was not possible but uh, these uh, uh, these uh, actually I think uh, in the new context of federal federal system at the moment uh, that uh, this I think uh, we have to mobilize the local governments that is uh, I think they, they will be the vital agencies who are nearest to the people the ward offices 
and the municipal, municipal offices, they will be capable enough uh, uh, to have the linkage with the people, have their uh, sort of the uh, sort of the uh, sort of the uh, the coordinate and the facilitate to the people, so that the people will be able to ex uh, to, to 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 reach to the financial institutions, and then and then will be able to access the the, the soft loan that is being uh, that that is being provided uh, by the government. I think that sort of approach that we have to design. Secondly. Uh, second aspects of the component of this program that we have thought is that the uh, uh, the sort of the skill development training and the training programs to, uh, might be needed for the people either in uh, the entrepreneurship, develop, entrepreneurship development or the skill development for uh, for giving the opportunity for the people uh, to uh, to be employed in the certain sort of industries or the in, in the different sectors as well so that is that was the second sort of the aspect that we have to think about third aspect i would like to say is the access to the market certainly at the certain level of the products, whatever that the people will be doing, the entrepreneurs will be developing or the producing, they should be um, have the, the opportunity to to have the better ma market access also. So in that regard also, I think there is a need of one of the institutional mechanism in the in each of the local governments and also and 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 then they have the certain sort of the human resources of the people the, for the promoting the business to the to the to the communities to the to the uh, concerned entrepreneurs uh, so there is a need that we have to design a program in such a way uh, looking into the overall federal sort of setup right. and then concentrating mainly uh, with the with the, with the, with the uh, through the local government units i think through this approach we will be able to to address uh, the most vulnerables and also the the people who are uh, really in the need uh, that was the sort of the idea that we have designed in the past, but uh, uh, because of uh, different reasons, because of the time constraint, I would like to say, uh, that program was not possible to be launched. Uh, I hope in the future the government will be able and our development partners will also be able to design this program from this perspective and will be able to implement that, uh, the, the concept, whatever that we have designed in the, in the past. So uh, with this, uh, I think uh, this session has been really been very, very useful. Uh, and also very, very fruitful also. And uh, the, um, I would like to thank to the commentators who have provided a very, very valid set of these, uh, the suggestions and the feedback to us. And, the, and, then the, and also to the, the thematic team, the compendium team, and especially Dr. Vishnu Bandari, who have led this uh, set of the process and have been able to come up with these uh, set of the uh, results. And then the, certainly we'll be accommodating uh, the suggestions that has come up in the chat box and also the question and answer queries also, and also the suggestion that have been provided by the commentators and other people. So with this, uh, I would like to again thank uh, to you all. Uh, thank you very much uh, for participating in this program, in this session, and, the, and the, I would like to close uh, uh, this session here. Thank you very much. It is a bit earlier, actually, to close, three minutes. <laughs> we didn't reach, um, that, that is what I'm very good, yeah. Uh, maybe, I mean, you can start the next session, uh, most probably, Sio Saab, you can initiate the next session and then uh, we'll take this forward. We're having a continuous, uh, the program uh, uh, is going on. Uh, uh, now the next uh, session uh, that is related to the risk and relief. So uh, the, uh, in this, uh, uh, I'm going to chair again uh, this session. Uh, and the Dr. Chandra Van Bader Sesta will be uh, moderating this session. Uh, uh, and this, I think, uh, Mr. Anil uh, Pokhrel, uh, who is also the executive chief of NDRRMA, is going to, going to make a presentation. And the, we are having a very distinguished uh, set of the moderators and the uh, 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 that we have. Uh, Mr. Lila Mari Pokhrel, who is the former chief secretary of the government of Nepal. Uh, and he was also the former uh, Nepal's ambassador to uh, China. And Ramraj uh, Narsinghe. Uh, Narsimhan, uh, he is from UNDP, and Bipul Nepani uh, from NRCS. So uh, I think uh, now, Dr. Sandra, uh, you will be moderating this session. Thank you very much. Um, as uh, Sunil Sar just mentioned that, this, the presentation will be made by um, engineer Anil Pokharel. Anilji, are you with us? 
yes sir good morning everyone thank you very much thank you very much so anil ji to just to introduce anil ji uh, anil ji has done master degree in environmental management la university usa he has 20 years plus experience in this sector and then his specialized area of specialization is drr disaster risk reduction and management so anil ji is at present chief executive of ndrrme uh, in a way nr is a successor actually we are pinning a lot of hope on ndrrme that it will take forward all lessons what we have been learning now uh, and then implement so uh, your presence is your presentation here is in a way i mean the rescue relief but also uh, we are trying to engage with you to hand over our responsibilities so that you can take uh, forward and um, uh, most probably i don't have to introduce um, uh, mr lila mani podel lila sir are you there yes yes i am here uh, thank you very much uh, it may not be necessary for me to introduce you but still i mean customarily we have been doing this uh, you did your mba uh, from trivandrum university by the way i mean we were together while doing mba i, I also did mba <laughs> and um, yeah, uh, lila manji has experience of 31 years uh, in the government of nepal and uh, in his area of specialization is governance public service delivery and his interest is social campaigning diplomacy social enterprise i uh, really i mean uh, remember now you when you mentioned social campaigning this bagmati uh, clean um, uh, bagmati clean save bagmati campaign actually i mean is initiated by was initiated by uh, lila mani ji and then has been i think i saw 400 or something weeks uh before one uh, week or so if i remember correctly and then uh, lemonji was uh, ambassador nepal's ambassador to people's republic of china before eight months uh, he came back and engaged in a lot of i mean academic and other um, administrative type of i mean uh, areas yeah. welcome sir you are most welcome uh and uh, we have another com commentator mr ramraj narasimhan undp ramraj ji are you there Uh, yes, Dr. Uh, yes. Chandraji, I'm here. Yes, thank you very much. Just to introduce Ramraj Narasimhan as well. He has uh, uh, Ramrajji has Master of Planning Housing from New Delhi, and then he has also 19 years of experience and specialization. Uh, his area of specialization are DRR, Disaster Risk Management, Early Warning, Housing and Recovery. We all are there. So uh, we are. This session is also very, very much. I mean, vibrant session. We are expecting to have the way how we had earlier sessions as well. So uh, Anil ji, I mean, the floor is yours. Please start presenting. Your time is thirty minutes. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you, thank you, Chandra sir, uh, respected chair, um, secretary of NRA, distinguished guests and commentators. and more importantly uh, i see a quite a large number of participants uh, participating in this uh, in this event since yesterday uh, we i'm glad that nra is taking this initiative particularly in terms of documenting these lessons uh, spreading it widely and more importantly it's part of a process what we've discussed together as a part of a, a knowledge systems and capacity handover to to the national disaster risk assessment and management, management authority let me now let me go into the presentations um uh, and um and then get back to you if uh, there's questions later on is is my screen uh, visible sir it is visible please go ahead yes yes it's since it's logged in if you are encountering problem from there our colleagues from here uh, will be able to help you they will upload presentation material from here as well i i, I will yes i think is is it visible now it is visible it is visible please go ahead yeah thank you thank you so <clears throat> i'll i'll start with an overview of the 2015 earthquake uh, the uh, as you all know the response to 
the 2015 earthquakes uh, in Nepal was the strongest in history, seen both from, from a national as an international perspective. Uh, if, you, if we recollect our experiences in terms of the, the total number of, uh, of houses, uh, infrastructures damaged, uh, it was evident that this was, uh, this was, this was the worst of, of any disaster event that, has, that had occurred in, in our country. Uh, with close to 9,000 people, that 22,000 people injured, and more than 800,000 houses collapsed. This was no doubt the largest undertaking within within Nepal from a disaster response perspective. Uh, I'd also want to take you back more than five years back when uh, when the NDRMA didn't exist. Uh, the, the abiding law back then was the 1980s uh, Disaster Relief and Response Act. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we had, uh, we just recently, actually two, just two years before, we'd come up with a national disaster response framework that actually helped us guide the, the, the national response. The PDNA was taken a little bit later, uh, later that did give us give us a full extent of the uh, extent of damage uh, but the actual response and the relief was guided by the prime minister's, nat prime minister's natural disaster uh, relief guidelines it was also if you look at it from from an international perspective never before in history had such an extensive international assistance outpoured within within nepal from a from a disaster context uh, there are more than 34 countries with with large number of uh, of teams arriving um, and and humanitarian assistance professionals coming coming into Nepal, uh, and some of those countries, especially the neighboring countries, where there were the right right day, uh, countries teams from from India, from Pakistan, from from China, were right there uh, on the work within within less than 24 hours. If we reflect back. There's also a strong security forces and a, and a civilian coordination uh, system, which, which got improved much later, uh, much, much better. Uh, our chief secretary back then, uh, Mr. Dilamo de Podil, is, is by now part of the committee and he'll be happy to kind of like perhaps uh, extend more light on this. Um, but, but if we reflect back, we also witnessed a strong civil and a public response, particularly the, the self kind of, uh, a response from from youths, multiple professionals, engineers, medical professionals, doctors, the media professionals, the NGOs, the INGOs, development partners, private sector, uh, everyone from from society were were right there, uh, despite the fact that again never before in history had such a such an experience taken place and, and such an operations had had taken place in the history of Nepal. It was also prior to the 2015 uh, constitution that we, we did come out later on. Uh, I'd also wanna uh, brief this audience that uh, our, our local governance structure was completely different. We had VDCs, but they were devoid of, of elected representatives. It was run by uh, seven party mechanisms. And so, uh, so if you compare the, the five year scenario and back then there's, there's a completely different set of, set of situation. So that's a setting where, where, where the government of Nepal jointly with, uh, with, with development partners, with volunteers, NGOs, INGOs, the UN agencies, and a lot of other humanitarian agencies undertook uh, unprecedented uh, rescue and relief operations in 2015. Now, but having said that, again, it didn't come with, uh, it, it wasn't devoid challenges and, and issues. Uh, at, a, at an institutional and organizational level, uh, we, at the first place, had no idea as on the extent of damage itself and, and what was the needs. Uh, so this was this is one of the biggest challenges to start with. Uh, the, the main administrative block uh, itself was was in Tatars, the Singha Darbar, as we all know, um, had had sustained major damages. Uh, uh, um, I, I do recall meeting Lamadi sir uh, in his in his tent's off in his tent uh, just outside the Singha Darbar private premises. But but from a from an issueful and organizational perspective, again, there's inadequate search and rescue capacity within within the country. I don't need to um, to delve much more on that. Uh, but but also if you look at it from a systems perspective, there's there's limited. There's only one international airport. The systems were not adequate. Uh, we didn't have enough 
a lift capacity within within the country itself, which which did get improved later on once the international assistance did, did start coming in. Back then, we also had a, had a limited stock of emergency supplies and emergency services. Fortunately, the first humanitarian staging area, uh, which has been built just right next to the airport, had just been operational. That was perhaps one of one of um, one of a deja vu situation again. Had that that facility not come into place back then, would have been a, a, a much a difficult challenge. But there are also like a lot of other other challenges, especially in terms of having having adequate policies, uh, the technologies, tools, equipments, and the skills to to dismantle a lot of damaged structures, the, the equipments, the technologies. But as I said earlier, again, not only in, at the Kathmandu level, but also in at the district level, uh, the operations uh, to coordinate this response was was challenging. Uh, again, the, the facility, the infrastructures, particularly government office buildings, uh, had had collapsed, and and some of those government staff members, uh, similar to other international experiences such as in Haiti and others, uh, had uh, the. The government staff had themselves sustained damages and perhaps death within the families itself in some of those those districts. Uh, so it was a, 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 a definitely a, a challenging time in terms of undertaking the response uh, and relief operations back then. Over to my next slide. It's not only the institutional and the operational challenges, but also from a uh, from an operational perspective. If you look at uh, the the area that got hit hard, uh, where remote, far off, and, um, and it was a rugged area. The map it was mountainous, very high altitude in some places such as Langtang, some parts of Sindhupalcho, Gorkha, and other, other districts. And, and in, in some of those places, there's, a, there's an absolute, complete destruction of infrastructures, no roads, no water supply, uh, no connectivity again. Uh, uh, and, and the extent of damage extended not only to those 14 districts, but also to a larger number of districts out of these 75 districts, uh, covering a large 30 square, 30, close to 30,000 square kilometers. <clears throat> the only good side of things were, again, it was it happened right close to the capital. Uh, it happened in the middle of a day and and on a Saturday, where most of the family members were together, perhaps uh, outdoors, hiking, walking around, playing. Uh, had it had it occurred in the middle of a night, or during the middle of a, a work day on an office day, or even to take it further from a risk perspective, had it had it occurred during the middle of a monsoon where where the ground conditions are saturated, the extent of damage and the destruction would have been many folds. Perhaps that is what something that we could have qualified as a, as a catastrophe. Again, this was. This was again from much of much of a risk management perspective. This was this is what is what could likely be a trailer of a, of a larger catastrophic event that is that is building up in the Nepal Himalayas. Now, now on an operational level, again, uh, it's not only the earthquake. Earthquake had had triggered a lot of landslides, uh, which was later on mapped by in, under NRA's leadership. Uh, quite an extensive uh, number of landslides had taken place, uh, especially in places like like Raswa, Gorkha, Sindhupalcho, uh, Dhading, and other districts, that led to the damages of of, of the road and other infrastructures. Uh, and and for that reason, operationally conducting a, one of the largest, historically largest rescue and relief operations was definitely challenging. To worsen it, the weather conditions again, despite it having it in in, uh, in in the month of April, again, we unfortunately in, in the sense that there's long, strong strong winds and then some drizzles and rain started pouring in, that made the life of those people who were displaced, living in tents, living in shanty tents, uh, were were even miserable. Rescue and relief workers had a difficult time. Uh, to, to navigate those difficult weather conditions at a, at a situation where, where roads, infrastructure, fast facilities, connectivity were, were really poor. A lot, of, <clears throat> a lot of communities, especially in the rural areas, including urban areas, had difficulties in terms of managing rubble, the debris that had fallen from these, these structures. 
uh, numerous uh, children had lost their their parents um, and providing care to those was was also equally challenging uh, and more importantly gaining accessibility to and to locate where those settlements were were there that were most needy in terms of uh, of relief and response uh, was was one of the biggest challenges that we all had to confront with now but what what were what was the institutions, especially the government institutions, the donor partners, INGOs, and the NGOs we're doing here here from a from an operational perspective? So, if you if you recollect, um, Lamadi sir had walked to the office, perhaps one of those was one of those first few batches of of, of of very high level senior officials to walk to senior Dawar premises. Uh, there are other secretaries as well who would, would come in. Now the ministers would walk into the National Emergency Operations Center. Uh, fortunately, we had that building to, to even conduct that meeting. Uh, that was a, a, a part of a, a reflection of a, a preparedness and, an, and a result of an investment decision that, that took place in a few years, had taken a few years here earlier. <clears throat> Within two hours of the event, uh, the Central Natural Disaster Relief Committee have been have been called. Uh, and subsequent to that, the um, the CNRC meeting had met for more than perhaps uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but something more than 20 of those meetings had have taken place. We have documented those those uh, uh, those events and those decisions that have been that have been taken by under the leadership of Ministry of Home Affairs, and and more importantly, uh, the, within four hours, the Council of Ministers had held the emergency meeting uh, under the under the chairmanship of the acting Prime Minister back then. Uh, the meetings were followed by again meeting of secretaries under the, the chair of the chief secretary of the government of Nepal. Uh, the regional disaster relief committees, the district relief committees, uh, had planned and started implementing the, the activities uh, following the instructions that were received from from the CNDRC. And the and we also had the operational command. I'll, I'll come back to that later on. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, but again, if you look at again, reflecting back some of the things that I've mentioned it earlier, on to the left is is a is a is a representative representative picture of a of a school that collapsed. Uh, if I may use the word pancaked, uh, this is this is from Sindhupalcho. Um, so again, to repeat again, uh, this happened earthquake happened on a on a on a Saturday on the middle of a day. Uh, now we could imagine like the number of children we could have lost had it been on an operational day. But more importantly, again, from a, from a response and a relief perspective, what I'd like to again recollect is, is these schools, had it been constructed, designed and built to withstand some of these, as I say, trailer sakings, these places could have been used as, as um, uh, a response site, especially for hosting some of those displaced populations who had lost their, their families and the houses. Not only these kind of schools, all over in most of the places, and it's been we've been able to witness from the success of the National Reconstruction Authority in, in rebuilding robust engineered design schools later on within the last five years. We could see some of those buildings that are now able to withstand some of these, these major shocks. These buildings would be able to now host some of these families that would, would likely uh, sustain major damages in their in their shelters. It wasn't the case back then, especially in this uh, 14 plus a total of 32 districts. It's still till today. If if we go if we reflect on on other districts in Nepal, the situation is not not better as as what we see in this this picture of, of this this pancake school building in in, in Sindhupalcho. if you look at a lot of lot of schools especially in these non-32 districts um, the province four province five province six and seven the Karnali Pradesh uh, some of the school buildings are are even worse uh, in, from a risk perspective and imagine with one good again like keep Imagine like you know, what would happen uh, if these schools would, would again collapse in a in an event that could sustain any time during our, our life lifespan. Not only schools, but also hospitals, health facilities, equally in Kathmandu and other urban centers, but also in remote rural areas, sustain major damages. Some of them pancaked the same way that this picture shows. 
electricity supplies, the power stations uh, were dysfunctional. The transmission lines didn't function in some of those places. Water supply situation, uh, both due to earthquake and also due to landslides were severe. Some of those water spring sources uh, stopped yielding water because of the saturating effect of those of this landslides. Uh, the source died down and then only popped up a few hundred meters downstream. Uh, water supply systems were not functional. Telecommunication systems, we didn't really sustain, again, the major damage, but, but the, the amount of flow of communication that was happening, especially uh, for, from people living abroad, uh, trying to connect to their families, did, uh, did imply a huge load in terms of getting connectivity. Now, at a, at a local level, now, if you, if you could also imagine uh, at a household level, uh, when, when houses, these systems collapse, it's also the food systems also collapse, uh, especially the stores, the granaries uh, that came down tumbling with, with the debris. And so the food systems were, were, were not there. Uh, the road systems had been, had been severed and, and quite a chaotic situation, especially in the rural remote areas. Uh, and more important to find out where those peoples are, where, which had sustained some of those major uh, damages was, was definitely a challenge. So this is where it is not only the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the security agencies, but also uh, through the CNDRC, the roles and responsibilities of the ministries, other departments, the district disaster management committees were, were crucial. And this is where the CNDRC, CNDRC was successful in terms of convening that, that event. Uh, managing emergency shelters, managing temporary learning centers for, for schools. And the, again, this was a situation prior to what we constructed after this with the support of NRA. So during those few days, weeks, and, and months, this is where uh, the biggest set of challenges in terms of managing these, uh, these shelters and, and centers were, uh, were crucial. Uh, on a day-to-day on -day operational perspective, uh, a central command post formed under the Ministry of Home Affairs Secretary, uh, and under which there's a, um, another command post formed under the uh, leadership of, of a Joint Secretary of Ministry of Home Affairs, coordinated uh, these operations. Uh, the Nepal Army had, had its Sankat Mochan operations, the Dhrib Sankalpa operations, such as specific for, specifically targeted for certain, certain districts such as <clears throat> Such as Langtang, where where an entire settlement had been decimated, uh, the army, um, the multinational military coordination center was established, and then there was the on-site operation coordination centers were operational. Uh, each of each of these security agencies had their own command centers. These were coordinated by by the command post uh, at the Ministry of Home Affairs. At the same time the network of, of NGOs and INGOs also rallied to, to support rescue and relief efforts, especially in areas where, where they had a strong presence, but also all in areas where they had never been, been exposed and never been working in the past. Volunteer groups autonomously started act, being activated, especially the youths and the professionals and were, were heavily in, uh, engaged. And more importantly, time. the emergency we clusters uh, uh, were, were put into, put into Action. Sorry, I mean, for interruption, uh, could you please take care of time so that I mean, you, you uh, finalize uh, with comfortably all key messages sure. as well. Please go ahead. Sorry for interruption. Sure. So now, now a few moments in terms of reflecting on the lessons learned. Um, again, um, there's, um, as, as we all know, again, the need for strengthening capacity of national search and rescue, uh, focusing on, on all three security agencies is, is is, is a huge priority. Now, um, as uh, uh, the, the 2015 constitution completely changed, made a, made a tectonic shift in terms of, again, the governance in, in Nepal. Uh, now, uh, now we have the elected, we have say, 53 local governments, the capacities needs to be kind of strengthened. Uh, and, and reflecting back, we, we didn't have an incident command system in the, in the past. And so, <clears throat> so in terms of, again, additional lessons, what we need is, is mechanisms to, to manage international support for search and rescue, relief and recovery. We need to strengthen the capacity of, of national search and rescue teams, um, establish mechanisms for international support, but also in terms of how we use media and in terms of social media, uh, in terms of reaching the unserved and far remote, remote areas. 
continuing on the on the lessons, uh, uh, we need to develop SOPs for incoming multinational humanitarian assistance and disaster response teams. Uh, we need to also form trained local volunteer units at the local level. This has been identified by the by the 2017 Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Act. Uh, we also need to look at reflecting on the lessons. Uh, need to have strong mechanisms to address the need for the injured, disabled, elderly, and the women. Uh, both food and non-food items are um, usually scarce, especially after such catastrophic events. Uh, events we need to look at both food and non-food non-food items. More importantly, the disaster information system is is of critical importance in terms of managing disaster events such as such as the one in 2015. Uh, uh, at situations where roads and connectivity get severe, uh, helipads are, are a crucial lifeline. Uh, managing those helipads in advance does help help build build strength and connectivity in those those areas. And more importantly, and this is something that we we've already started working on, is the uh, is provisioning of emergency warehouse and adequate stockpiling of appropriate supplies and and equipments. I'd like to highlight the, the role of open spaces, uh, and which is evident from, from urban settings such as in Kathmandu, where, where some of those allocated sites for temporary shelters and debris management was insufficient. They, 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 they really were a huge, um, they were they're very useful, some of these outpoured in terms of the number of people they were able to kind of serve. Now to conclude, uh, again, uh, what we see is, is there's a major shift in terms of the, the governance of disaster risk reduction and management. We now have the new 2015 constitution that identifies the role of the federal, the provincial and the, and the local governments. The role of these, uh, these local governments have been very clearly identified in terms of disaster rescue and response. Uh, uh, and, and the need to strengthen their, their capacity is, is, is something is of, of real prime importance that the NDRMA has prioritized. It, it cannot be understated that by saying that again, critical infrastructure needs, needs enhancing the newly endorsed building codes needs to be implemented so that our, these systems do not collapse in such a in terms of these kind of disasters. Um, and, and with the rate of increase of the risk, risk, not only due to earthquake, but also for climate change and other risks, we need to, to, we need to look at prepositioning appropriate equipment, supplies, uh, managing of relief stores for immediate response. Uh, we, we have to have established systems for including vulnerable groups, in, especially in high-risk locations. And, and, and an interesting observation that we've collectively made is the facilitation of remittance subsidizing through subsidizing transfer fees. Bank accounts is so much critical in terms of autonomous uh, relief and response for, uh, during the times of such, such earthquake. Key takeaways that, <clears throat> that we'd like to end with uh, is, again, uh, the 2015 earthquake lessons did lead us to the formation of the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Authority. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's in its national stage. Um, uh, needless to say that the capacity strengthening of the NDRMA, uh, in addition to, to the provincial, the district disaster management committees, the local governments and the communities has to be a continuous process and needs to be expedited uh, in light that these, these kind of disasters would, would occur anytime. Uh, I've, I've mentioned the need for, for increased emergency facilities and systems compared to the increasing urbanizing rate and the change in risk. Uh, obviously, we need additional open spaces to manage emergency shelters, uh, um, shelters the, and, and reflecting on the 2015 experience, how do we manage an outpouring humanitarian assistance uh, that we receive? Uh, and, and that is fit with the local approaches and the culture needs to be really thought through and communicated and established through SOPs. Uh, as I said earlier in the slide, in the slide earlier, the gas assistance is really effective in affected municipalities, especially where these markets are functioning. It's much better than, than relief, such as managing relief uh, in terms of clothes and, and other food items. Uh, those are more effective. Uh, but managing such a, such a large scale disaster event requires proper communication plan and a communication strategy for these kind of emergencies. Uh, and, um, and again, I'd like to reiterate uh, by saying that again, these, these large scale relief and response actions are only effective, are only possible through joint actions of the government, non-government, the private sector, relevant partners, 
and individuals. So this is where we need to continuously engage on and strengthen these kind of systems. Much of the owners and much of the lessons uh, would actually imply it to the new, new, newly formed National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Authority. These are some of the challenges and so also equally some of the priorities that we will set aside in our upcoming action plan that we are actually implementing on. We remain committed to, to continue this engagement, especially with NRA and the larger uh, experiences that we've collectively acquired in terms of, again, shaping up the NDRMA during its initial days. Um, I'd like to stop here and pass it over to, to our moderator, Dr. Chandra, sir. Uh, over to you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Uh, well done. Uh, you perfectly finished within time. It, it is really good. Uh, my Just uh, to make clear, actually, the uh, presentation version which was circ circulated to commentators and uh, the way uh, the version which uh, Anilji presented now, there is slight variation. I would request you to uh, present, I mean, to, uh, comment on the basis of the uh, version which is presented. So, uh, so sorry for a bit like uh, ambiguity uh, there. Uh, having said that, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Lilamani Podel. Uh, to start your comment. Over to you, sir. Um, thank you, uh, Chandraji. Uh, Sunil, sir? Sunil, sir. Okay, fine. Thank you. You are audible. Yeah. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, NRA, uh, Mr. Gemali and uh, his team for uh, organizing this wonderful program. Uh, actually, one of the basic lapses that in government system is that the documentation of the work we've done uh, in whether in case of emergencies or in the, even in a, in a normal day to day work. Um, uh, this kinds of uh, yeah, seminar conference would definitely uh, help our reflect uh, our uh, previous actions in case of uh, emergencies and then that uh, lesson can be uh, uh, taken forward uh, for the future management. Um, having said so, um, I would like to congratulate uh, Anil uh, Pokhil for uh, uh, having opportunity to serve this uh, newly uh, established uh, NDRIMA as a uh, uh, CEO. Um, you have the uh, big responsibility, although I have some apprehensions on the structure and the, and the uh, present status of the, of the uh, uh, NDRIMA, uh, the status particularly. Uh, however, um, the institution is there, and the uh, actually the present responsibility of, of a pandemic would have been handed over to you, so that uh, you would have uh, uh, learned also the respond the already uh, set of mechanism is utilized for for responding this uh, course. Um, uh, in your paper, uh, when you were presenting, rather than listening you, I was reflecting my those days that how we uh, handle that situation and then uh, what sort of the uh, circumstances at that uncertainties and then uh, chaotic situations that we faced and then we handled those uh, um, considering the, uh, the, the legal, institutional, uh, technological capabilities and the previous experience of uh, uh, our uh, uh, disaster response uh, capability, uh, our capabilities and pre previous experiences on such disasters. The scale and magnitude of that responses that we have to make was uh, alarmingly ex uh, uh, disproportionately high. And then uh, we were somehow uh, did so by uh, learning and doing and then uh, applying our best knowledge. And then are trying to um, um, somehow that uh, um, manage the things within that uh, limited uh, um, resources and the limited uh, uh, experience and knowledge and capabilities, particularly capabilities, I should say. Um, I would like to suggest uh, Anilji, your presentation. I don't want to much more uh, um, uh, that give emphasis on what you said, what you did not say like that, but uh, one thing I would like to do, go back and again do one more exercise that uh, make the very detailed account of the activities carried on in very first hour and the first day and second day up to the seven days. Every detail, please do it. It will be very, very useful for you and for not only for you and maybe for the nation and for the society. 
uh, that every second was important on that uh, moment. And then I agreed to comment uh, on this paper because I wanted to communicate this matter to the people who have been working in this area. That every second is important, not even minute. That's why it is not sufficient enough just to list down that cabinet meeting set and then uh, central disaster risk resp uh, uh, response committee's meeting was held. And then you have to uh, uh, detail account that who did what so that you can actually uh, how the things were just handled uh, in, in that situation. And then, and then we managed that uh, very, very uh, big magnitude of disaster. Quite, I cannot say that it was perfect, but it was uh, one of the, I think that I was fully satisfied what we did based on the given circumstances. And then nobody was uh, uh, believed us on those days that they said that these people cannot handle this. There was not a single incident of the uh, people died because of the uh, post-disaster, some kinds of pandemic, or people were expecting that kind of thing. People were expecting that uh, there would be a, a chaotic situation in law and order. There will be looting and then uh, uh, sort of the very anarchism in the, in the society because these people cannot handle this. That was the people's comment that we have been receiving day and night and then when we are fighting against this uh, uh, disaster, again, uh, responding this this big, big disaster, but nothing happened. This is not because of that out of uh, the air, uh, just happened coincidentally, not like that. It was there are some people have very, very diligently and then very skillfully handled that situation and then responded so that then we didn't have a uh, a post disaster, uh, another disaster, another chaos um, that could have sometimes that more damaging than the exact, exactly the, the uh, particular disaster uh, damages the property and lives. Um, you have to uh, detail the account that uh, um, the people who responded, who act on how and then what, when, and then, and then. Uh, you can make the prepare a, a, a response plan uh, for the for the future. As you mentioned that there must be a, a SOP, standard operating procedure, so that in the, in the very disaster time and then people can uh, we can we can make people accountable for doing something. And then the central disaster um, that uh, uh, coordination committee is meeting, national disaster coordination committee is meeting was actually should have called by the Home Secretary. But uh, I reached there, the, I was the first senior official to reach the uh, NUC, National Disaster Response Oper Operation Center. The people were scared when I reached there and then very few people and the Home Ministry officials, they were scared. And then uh, they were not being able to communicate properly. And then the parts of information are coming, the ringing telephones and fax all the time, PG, PG, PG. And then, um, uh, very uh, uh, alarming types of the uh, informations were uh, were communicated to the to the NUC and then the the staff were not been able to exactly uh, uh, they they were confused and what to do what not to do and then how to do no and then it was very quietly and then uh, very uh, decisively uh, uh, resolved I mean that the instructed to mobilize all the district level uh, uh, disaster coordination committees meeting. And then within two hours, as you mentioned that uh, we organized a meeting. Actually, I called all the ministers and then I went there by my motorbike even. And there were people were not aware of that, what to do and then who to do. Even that uh, the, we call the, uh, the international level emergency that we, uh, we, we requested the international agency to respond. According to our um, disaster, um, a response strategy already approved in coordination with the uh, international ad agencies uh, under the leadership of the UNDP. And the UNDP has to coordinate these all sort of things. I don't want to blame anybody else, but the UNDP's resident coordinator was uh, next day, second day of the disaster, was standing outside the building and then asking that what is happening here. And then uh, when we were asking them to please find some tents, find some tarpaulins for the, for the uh, immediate, that temporary roofs. 
and then we were supplied by the water bottles. And then we, when we ask that the, uh, we need uh, the CSSR expert, the collapse structure, um, collapse structure search and rescue expert. But uh, the people uh, scam, they, who don't have any knowledge about the CSSR and then as a rescue team, where we never invited them, we never know them. And then they came to the airport and then they started to media campaign that, oh, government is not taking care to me. As if that uh, government should have there and then with, the, with, the, with the, some protocol officers and then asking them, please, you are most welcome, something like that. And then when I went to the Sindhu Palzo, there were floods of NGOs and they were consuming more food than the, actually the food required for to deliver to the, to the needy people in the, in the scarce areas. The remaining buildings were fully occupied by the NGOs. And then they don't have any specific responsibility, what to do, what not to do. When we, when we issued the order, and then you have not mentioned this sort of things. No? That's why it will not work when we future the similar kinds of the response, we have to make it and then there will be another chaos. That's why. What you need to do is that when there was a, the, the NGO, we government issued an order that there should be a coordinated efforts for providing relief material so that we know that where the relief material is reached and where not reached. Where that is, the road, road head is clear and then lots of NGOs reached there. And then they wanted to deliver the, let's say that 1,000 rupees material, but make the 100,000 rupees the propaganda. And then, and then criticize that, oh, government is doing not this thing and that thing. And then some other places, you mentioned that there was a food scarcity, not that there was no any food scarcity at that time. We had the only two major things, scarcity of two major things, that was a roofing material, particularly the temporary roofing materials, tent and tarpaulins, and then a little bit of uh, mid-term roofing materials, particularly when we, uh, the private houses need to build after, uh, it takes time uh, for rebuilding the private houses and then we need a uh, CGI sheet. You rightly mentioned that the government officials, they were trying to procure those things and they don't have capability, they don't have sources, but they wanted to buy. And then I fought with them, I fought with the cabinet ministers, even the very argument made with the prime minister for distributing cash. And then it worked. Otherwise, if you buy, try to go and buy the procure the materials and then you would fall in the procurement scandals and then there will be no supply at all. That's why if that the materials are available, government can make ensure that materials are available at the quality, quantity and time at the places. But that provide a cash and then people could have a choices, people, people can make the quick decision and then may handle these cases more easily than the uh, we go with the relief materials. That's why in the future, if government issues the order for the, for the coordinated efforts for, for providing relief materials through coordinated channel, it must be complied with, it must be followed. On those days when issued the government order and then this is a corrupt, they, they, they made a, we started to making a propaganda by almost all NGOs and uh, some of the working staffs in the, in the Indian Health Ad Agencies, very responsible staffs, made a campaign against the government that, oh, government is corrupt. Prime Minister's relief fund is uh, just, just for the private use of Prime Minister. This is all rubbish. And this propaganda. Handling that media is equally an important uh, and then for, for your uh, uh, benefit and then please make a very robust the, the media handling mechanism. Otherwise, you, a lot of time will be spent, is consumed for that purpose, not for the uh, actually the uh, response mechanisms. And the, I would like to suggest you to contact uh, um, Swarnim Wagli and then uh, get some uh, feedback and information from him. He has made a presentation in some international organization in London somewhere. And then uh, he has uh, presented with uh, detailed accounts of the uh, preliminary, uh, the early hours of the, of the uh, uh, disaster incident. And then also uh, you can contact with some of the people who were the, uh, uh, the responsible for, the, for handling the NUC. And then they can give you a more, uh, uh, more information about that. And then 
Um, seeing so, um, uh, once again, I would like to thank uh, the NRA and also the um, uh, uh, congratulate the uh, Anilji um, for uh, uh, whatever efforts you have made and then presented here and that definitely would contribute for uh, handling uh, future disaster uh, scenario in Nepal. Um, I fully agree with you that uh, had this been occurred in the, in the daytime and the, in the office day or school days, and then we failed to take a, a very uh, action. I was uh, in 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 uh, in line, and then I was in in. I I I have the view that the, someone should have held accountable for the school buildings collapse, which were very recently built and then um, said to have the earthquake resilient, but collapsed. Even the, some of the school buildings uh, not handed over even that not finished to uh, completely construction were completely collapsed. And then what went wrong? If uh, there was some negligence, poor uh, workmanship or the some quality uh, compromising and then some corruptions and then they should have uh, punished. Uh, on those days, I didn't have much time because at that time I should have definitely, we should have definitely focus on the saving lives rather than making the investigations, but later on, when the NRA was established, and then the response activities was carried on by NRA, and then there must have some mechanism to investigate that uh, uh, the things, uh, particularly that uh, how that public uh, infrastructures uh, disproportionately damaged, despite of the uh, of the uh, building code, and then and that was uh, earthquake resilient of that magnitude. And the also equally important is that uh, uh, after uh, that uh, uh, the primary response has already been finished, um, uh, there should be some mechanism to investigate the the public officials whether why who did what, why they some if some fail to um, um, actually that uh, 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 fulfill that uh, obligations or duties already assigned duties. And then people made definitely made accountable for that. Uh, such emergencies cannot be uh, cannot be cannot be excused. Some of the even even secretaries, I said that had I been capability to fire you, I could have fired. I said some of them, but that, that no action was taken. Some are very responsible. And then, and so when I asked him to come to the sing otherwise, I said that my wall is broken outside the house. What's the house? That's a, I cannot come. That was what his response was. That's why you have to take into account all, the, all those sort of things for handling that disaster in the future. My time is over. And then once again, thank you very much. I wish that a uh, conference a big success. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I think this is called listening from <laughs> horse's mouth. <laughs> so you yeah. learned, yeah, I mean, whole... Sorry for that. I could not uh, say you. It takes a whole day for me to uh, narrate all that, those sort of things. And it will really matter. It really matters. Actually, not, uh, uh, not uh, what, what we are thinking... Yeah, Our Siyo Saab yeah. and myself, we are just um, uh, whispering with each other. Maybe the, you may contribute our rescue and relief uh, paper that we have drafted something. Most probably you and Sony Mwagli can enrich this for, uh, further because you are you were the uh, handler paper. I mean, handler of the situation, leading the whole process. Most probably that will be the most appropriate thing to go. Um, would you like to say something, uh, or I, uh, I will. I will say maybe later on. But uh, just whatever Dr. Chandra has mentioned, I was just talking uh, together with Dr. Chandra that it will be better and it will be, the, I would like the best of the excellent that the if uh, Lamariji will be having a time to, to look into the compendium paper that we have uh, under the preparations at the moment. And then that will be uh, sort of the uh, great sort of contributions for the future. So I really request and then I will be talking, talking later, later on in this regard, certainly. Uh, thank you very yeah. much, sir. It is really interesting, sort of the, your uh, sort of feedback and suggestions today. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, may I invite Mr. Ram Raj Narasimhan? Uh, uh, Rilamani, sir, indicated a number of issues, actually. I mean, with regard to, he also indicated, implicated in a way, UNDP as well, the NGO government, I mean, dynamics, and then how NGOs, I mean, publicity orientation. 
uh, all those things. Uh, in addition to other comments on paper, we would be also the audience would be interested to listen. What is the perspective from UNDP side, UN side, uh, non-governmental side? Uh, Ram, um, Ram Raji, could you please, I mean, highlight those things? Uh, the time uh, we allocated a bit more time to Ram Raji because uh, it was so much interesting, and then we all were enlightening for that. Uh, that's why we allowed. And if possible, you can decrease your presentation to seven minutes. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Um, I'll try to speak within five minutes and keep to the uh, presentation made by Anilji. It's really a challenge to speak after somebody like uh, Leela Maniji, who's handled the crisis at that point of time. So, um, uh, but then I, I've also been there. I've been there in uh, Nepal, um, visiting Nepal and also lived in Nepal for the last uh, six, seven years. So, and also faced the earthquake. Uh, congratulations to Anilji for actually making a, a very succinct presentation of the millions of uh, person days of effort that people have put in, in the rescue and the relief. So it's not a very easy task and uh, congratulations on accomplishing that. In your very first slide, there is a, there is a report, there is a uh, picture of a report that is uh, released by the Ministry of Home Affairs, which actually uh, documents in a great level of detail the response of the government, non-government agencies and all private sector in the earthquake. So I think there is a lot of wealth of information that is available from that report, which could be capitalized um, further. Um, the other point is this is coming under the ages of the NRA, which is looking largely at the reconstruction, but we understand there is a very definite connect to the NDRRMA in the transitioning. Starting from the PDNA, it would be very helpful if the paper could also delve into the um, kind of uh, dichotomy that we see. The disaster effects on the DRR assets itself was the most minimal. It was barely 1.5 million. Um, like I think one of the uh, questions is from Ram Bhandariji from JICA. He and I were actually co-leading the support to the Ministry of Home Affairs in the PDNA. Uh, from JICA and UNDP. And we were aghast to note that the actual impact of the earthquake on the DRR uh, facilities was very minimal because not much really existed, number one. And the recovery needs was around um, $82 million. Since then, in the last five years, what has been accomplished? It would be very uh, helpful to also understand if the paper could um, kind of uh, detail out uh, what many of the needs that were identified, how much of it has actually been uh, implemented. Uh, we also understand the challenge that you have because NDRRMA did not exist then and it's a relatively new organization. So uh, to, it would be uh, quite difficult to uh, account for what all has happened pre-NDRRMA. Um, but the uh, paper itself would be enriched if uh, this could be done. Uh, I also agree a lot with your point about the uh, need for enhancing search and rescue capacity, but also would like to um, emphasize that the initial minutes and the hours after the earthquake are most critical. And typically, it is the neighbors, the community themselves, who have rescued the maximum number of people in support, uh, um, also aided by the local uh, security forces who are present very near and who are able to rush within the minutes and the hours. So um, looking at uh, the role of uh, decentralized and local level uh, resources for continuing uh, the search and rescue uh, efforts would be very important. Uh, we've also had very successful cases, I think, um, of uh, rescue of uh, two or three people, even after five days. But these are very far and few uh, in, in numbers. But, and the maximum number of people, if there is one slide I have seen presented by, uh, I think, um, uh, uh, Dr. Subba uh, from the police, where the number of rescues that have been done within the first hour, second hour, third hour, and so on, it's actually quite enlightening that the maximum number of search and rescue 
of live people happens in the very first hours. And that's why it's very important to see what can be done to enhance local community level search and rescue capacities. The fourth point is also on the, uh, we understand that there is a lot of need for um, uh, facilities like uh, emergency operation centers, but then a lot of it remains uh, single purpose use. What happens in the normal times? Uh, local governments and the uh, provincial governments need to put in their own resources as well as the federal government to keep these uh, EOCs up and running and in full operational status. And they are loath to doing it unless it serves the purpose during normal, that is non-emergency times. Um, the fifth one is looking more on the um, uh, agenda forward. I think India RMA is in the right place at the right time now. And a lot of hopes of, of all of us uh, in Nepal working in this sector rests on what India RMA would be uh, uh, moving forward with. Now, quite a lot that has been done since uh, the last one year that uh, you have, just over a year that you have been here, could also be uh, kind of captured. Uh, because this paper, I think, is also in, the tra in how it is transitioning from a recovery and reconstruction mm -hmm. into a longer term resilience. So um, things like the disaster monitor that uh, you are finalizing, the, the BIPAT system that has been put in uh, to help local governments and the provincial governments uh, manage their own risks. I think these are some of the uh, points that could actually be uh, also considered to include. Uh, and lastly, but I don't think the least one is also on the need for resources. A lot of plans have been evolved. I think in 2013-14, there was a national strategic action plan on search and rescue itself, which probably requires a lot of resources to actually implement. And these kind of resources probably need not come only from uh, uh, federal government. It could come also from the provincial and the local governments, because after all, this is a shared mandate. DRR is a shared mandate across all three governance systems. So uh, responsibilities as well as uh, resources need to come across from all uh, budgets. So anything that could be done in this line, including on the preparedness that, um, to ensure better coordination across these three. You mentioned CIMEX, you mentioned drills in the presentation. I think these are both excellent uh, uh, thoughts uh, to ensure that there is a well-coordinated response. I think I'll rest with this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you highlighted the community um, capacity for rescuing if that sort of uh, events take place. Similarly, um, a number of what happens in the normal situation, EOC, a number of many different issues you uh, really plugged in. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, having said that, not spending more time, uh, I would like to go to Mr. Bipul Neupane from NRCS. Bipulji, um, Please just start, actually, and then, uh, if possible, you can shorten your uh, presentation so that we will have also decent interaction with each other as well. Please, over to you, please. Thank you, Chandra, sir. Uh, thank you, Chandra, sir. Um, I will try to uh, keep myself as short as uh, possible. Uh, respected chair, uh, respected presenter, and all dignitaries, uh, good morning. So, um, I think most of your the Your visual uh, is not very clear. Are, uh, Sorry, people. Your visual is a bit, um, uh, there is some shadow. Uh, okay, I think maybe I, I turn off the camera, okay? Okay. I turn off the camera. Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, I think uh, I'm Bipul Neopane working uh, as a director of uh, disaster management department. I, and I have uh, very recently taken this portfolio as a director of uh, uh, disaster management department in uh, Nepal Red Cross. Uh, during uh, the, this uh, earthquake, I was in. Now, I was in airport actually to facilitate uh, the relief and uh, uh, the rescue teams or the uh, emergency uh, operation teams. Uh, we say ARU uh, emergency response units uh, uh, from different. Um, uh, countries they arrived uh, actually uh, we received around 30 ERUs from different uh, uh, different countries 
so uh, i have also some like a practical type of experiences uh, on how uh, on these uh, uh, issues so um uh, this paper i i would like to congratulate anil sir for developing uh, such a nice uh, nice paper uh, i also equally echo with uh, dilamadi sir maybe we can uh, more capture the um, practical things and um, this is also important uh, for uh, future generations like uh, now we read uh, can be a very beneficial uh, for um, uh, future uh, uh, response relief as well as maybe th those who are interested to uh, to learn how our predecessors how, how their predecessors uh, actually um, uh, fight with uh, such uh, natural disasters so um, uh, anil sir has um, actually um, saved this presentations in in different part like uh, overview uh challenges and in challenge part it is and in lesson in uh, lesson learned like institutional and operational and uh, this there is conclusion and key messages uh, for uh, uh, rescue and overview part i would like to say like maybe rescue and relief at the present day is largely shaped by how we are prepared uh, in uh, how we are we are prepared uh, so maybe it would from my perspective it would be better to have some uh, some uh, uh, some section or some part in what was what was the um, uh, preparation uh, for such a such a mega mega disaster uh, so i think uh, that might be um, one uh, one part, one part uh, in a, in a, in a synopsis and also maybe i was thinking um, uh, how how much people or how many uh, we reached with the uh, rescue and uh, relief and also the um, uh, how long the rescue and relief uh, relief operation uh, was uh, carried out it's uh, and we started the uh, recovery uh, such uh, such information might be um, uh, nice and in the this challenge part in institutional and organizational part i think uh, most of the things are covered and um, uh, i think uh, this uh, custom and immigration um, custom um, uh, list but uh, the agencies have to go to the custom office then take a clearance and uh, we realized maybe in the custom and uh, uh, immigration there was uh, <clears throat> limited uh, exposure to this emergency response system like um, when a, a set of eru comes it it takes everything like self sustain uh, even um, Cyril uh, to like ex, ex, uh, like a port portable type of excavator. Uh, so I think um, there were many questions raised by customs like why you are bringing there is a so high need of uh, need of um, tarpaulins. Are you making business on such difficult time? I think these were the some challenges faced by the humanitarian agencies. So um, no. Sons or making custom and immigration relief and response friendly uh, also might be very helpful for uh, relief and uh, uh, rescue operations uh, in future. And in uh, at that time we received was uh, the relief support is overlapped in the. accessible areas high distribution and in lim limitedly or in remote areas uh, uh, limited uh, distribution was there so i think uh, the maybe the government uh, tried to to monitor it but uh, still there were uh, it was uh, it was a challenge so um, uh, maybe how we can uh, overcome such challenges in future and in humanitarian staging area i think it is a big very um a good uh, concept however may it would be nice if uh, like we can allocate the areas on such areas like this species can used by undp or un agencies this area can be used by uh, red cross movement maybe this area by other humanitarian agencies like this then uh, those uh, uh, relief materials can be stored in their, uh, that place and can be transported to Uh, to the needy people maybe management of humanitarian staging area might uh, be also 
uh, one that we can improve in in future. Uh, and also like equipment and many other things was very uh, is very crucial. Like in airport, even we, we lack this uh, frog lift uh, to um, uh, to lift uh, up the materials. So it was very basic things. Uh, later on, the KHL provided and that was managed. Uh, so um, uh, such a uh, uh, preparation of such equipment also is uh, is a very uh, very uh, crucial. Uh, so um, in uh, and in overall, I would say like maybe uh, this uh, um, rescue and relief is uh, sometimes we think it is like a material uh, like a providing tarpaulin, like a receiving one. Uh, tarpaulin was like a nightmare. Still, uh, maybe there are so other things associated with like uh, JC uh, to be more inclusive, uh, mental uh, health aspect like uh, social psycho support and health relief. Uh, relief. So, uh, I think these are some, uh, some things that are missing in uh, in this paper. Uh, so it would be nice to, to put a light in those areas uh, also. Thank you, Vipulji. Thank you very much. Sorry, uh, slightly I, uh, I interrupted because... Uh, and uh, one thing like, uh, and one final uh, remarks from my side is yeah. in key messages like uh, cash assistance is mentioned as effective, uh, but um, in, the, in the main part of the paper, this cash, how the cash was uh, uh, effective is, is not mentioned. Like Lila Madi sir, he rightly mentioned maybe uh, that, uh, that part is, is missing in the main, uh, main part. Uh, so uh, mainly we like rescue and relief. Some, sometimes we uh, it is it comes together, but are quite different. Uh, different rescue is more like a, a more technical uh, maybe, and relief can be more social and cultural things. So it might be better to uh, to separate those things. Um, maybe in a sub sub uh, sub group or a sub chapter level. However, however I say. Uh, in in one while writing in the paper, maybe uh, it would be sure. nice to have like a risk to thank you part uh, and uh, relief part. Uh, this sure. way they are disregarded. Thank you very yeah. much. Uh, thank you very much. To you. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I, I'm coming back because we have only uh, 20 22 no, minutes no. time. Hi. So, thank you very much. Uh, actually, I mean, all of you, all three commentators are have made your hands dirty actually i mean during this rescue and relief operation so it is it is really good to listen from all of your side uh Lila Manishar from the macro uh, um, macro level and then uh people the micro level on the grassroots level and um, ramraj the somewhere intermediate meso level so it, it is really very good i mean a blending of three commentators of three different perspectives but one thing is, uh, one thing came very, very much clearly that um, the, the strength of government operation was not that weak as it is normally perceived. And because uh, there, a lot of, I mean, um, a lot of catastrophes were averted. That, is, that was the strength of the government. Despite a lot of limitations, government still has a lot of, I mean, a strength it can cope with. That, that was the success story in a way that we also experienced, I mean, all of us experienced. But there are, I mean, uh, problems, problems in both ends. I mean, uh, from government point of view, there are problems in the NGO sector. And NGOs, for example, Bipulji mentioned that the airport I mean, system was not appropriate. And you know, so there, there, there are certain scope for further improvement in the government sector. Most probably, whole, I mean, uh, all uh, this institutional landscape, we all have our, our uh, area for further improvement. Having said that, how does it look like now? And then how are you thinking to take forward? Are we um, in proper shape or how, what is your transitional plan? What is your long-term plan? Anilji, could you please, I mean, just five minutes, uh, um, highlight all those three commentators and then I will come back again to you with the um, uh, questions from the floor, which we received from the chat box. Over to you, Anilji. <clears throat> thank you, thank you, Chandra, sir. And also 
uh, and, and I use uh, use thanks to all those three commentators. Uh, your opinion, each of those those sentences were had have deep meaning, and we made a note of it. I'm, I'm sure the secretariat is also recorded. Uh, we will be able to kind of like and transcribe those in terms of again helping it write this whole chapter, this compendium itself. So once again, thank you so much for all the three commentators uh, on on your insights. Uh, we'll uh, oh, so. So it's been, it's been, this is our 11th month. And so right on the, on the first few months, we had to confront with uh, the response to the 2020 landslides and, and floods. Uh, what it does is, uh, is if you if you'd really kind of reflect uh, the transition within the last five years, there's been a, there's been a major change, uh, both from a, from a governance perspective, but also from, from institutions, but also the kind of trained human resources. Uh, that we have, but as you said, like again, it, this is um, it's uh, it's inadequate. We could we could bluntly say that it's inadequate. Uh, we aren't being able to kind of really reach to certain areas, especially far remote areas, on time. Um, uh, even reflecting on my experiences this year uh, uh, during during monsoon season, uh, the roads are, are severe. The roads connectivity are lost, and and the weather gets uh, inclement at the same time. We we Despite even having kind of airlift capacities, we're not able to fly to those those situations. Now, uh, now ever since we we started again, there are few there there's a uh, there are few priority areas that we've started working on. Say, from the first to start with is uh, is to draft a volunteer bureau formation and a mobilization guideline. Uh, why I want to highlight that is 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 based on 2015, 2015 earthquake experience. What we could say is, as it's also been highlighted by Nigel Fisher and some of the other, and also by commentators, is again, close to 18,000 people were rescued by, by communities and, and local, local volunteers. But if you compare that with the, the national search and rescue team, it's 4, 000, around like 4,000 people. And by international SAR, SAR teams, it's around 20. So, so in, in terms of investing, Capacity, for building capacities, it's the it's the local volunteers that really makes a difference. So this is exactly why uh, the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Act has very clearly identified the need to uh, to form this volunteer bureau and to train uh, volunteer volunteers at the local level. This is this is a priority that we we've really taken it up. We we now come up with a with a draft that's that's what we're discussing right now. Number two is uh, is to strengthen the emergency. A, um, emergency a, a store warehouse and relief relief centers. So uh, we have a national humanitarian staging area right next to the airport. But what we uh, what we have focused within the last few years and and been able to uh, launch it earlier this this year is is two two of these sites. One in Nepal, one in Hungary. The similar plans to build in in Birgans, in Viratnagar. And so each of the province, provinces would have those uh, those. Uh, uh, those regional provincial store sites. Thirdly, is also to to back that up with with mobile sites and also to have it at, at down to every 77 districts and at the municipal level itself. Right, Honorable Prime Minister has also very clearly highlighted the need to have it housed within each of those ward offices or down to a school level. That's a that's a direction that we want to take it. But in our initial years, jointly with development partners, UN, WFP, and others, we're working on, and with DFID, we're working on enhancing and strengthening the capacities, especially the warehouses. Uh, we've also recently <clears throat> come up with the. Uh, a, uh, a training manual, especially in terms of training the three security agencies, uh, making it coherent and, and consistent so that each of these security agencies are following a standard guideline in terms of training design for search and rescue. Uh, we've also in the final stages of approving uh, um, a, a standards for, for search and rescue materials and equipments. So that's, that's some of those achievements that we've been able to make within the last last few months. Uh, but this is this is not where things would stop. Again, uh, the incident national incident command system has been has been very clearly enshrined in the national act. This is an area that we'd like to go. Establishing an online system to understand where things are in terms of search and rescue uh, equipments, but also in terms of supplies, both food and non-food items. Not only for, that's owned by the government itself, but also how do you map it 
down to every agency, down to every local municipality. That's a challenge. Uh, if we have those information, we, we, we will be able to better respond, uh, back deep up with, with local volunteers, with, uh, with, with, this, with, with these three security agencies. And if needed, uh, if, if there's a situation for, a, for, a, for international assistance, this could be again, jointly co conducted with, with international humanitarian responders. So this is, this is an area that we've been, been working on. Uh, and it's been been outlined in our annual work plan as well. The next thing that we're also working on is to to graduate from a weather-based early warning system to an impact-based forecasting system that helps our responders not only for the earthquakes but also for for floods and floods and uh, landslides. These are some of the things that that we we begun this year, and we want to continue improving it over over the over the next few years. Uh, I'll stop here. Uh, uh, Thank you very much. Uh, it is uh, very nice. I mean, uh, excellent discussion has been taking place, but uh, I have to maintain time as a moderator, actually. That is a very difficult task for me to do. Uh, there are a number of having questions we received from Sankar Rakal from the Facebook and Dinanath Bhandari. Uh, question is to Anil Pokhrel, obviously, Yuvraj Pohrel, Ramprasad Bhandari, Surya Mohan Rakal, Dinanath Bhandari, and Suman Bailkoti, Nigel Fisher. So we received a number of questions, and they are extremely pertinent. But considering the time, uh, all, all those questions, actually, we will hand over to Anilji, and then he will respond uh, later on, I mean, uh, in writing. Most probably that is the only appropriate way to go. Otherwise, if we spend uh, time here, it may be a bit, um, uh, we cannot maintain, maintain our schedule, that is the problem. Uh, apology to all question raisers, but your question will not be forgotten. I mean, it will be there, and you will receive response from uh, our, our side. ICNR Secretariat will be handling this very, very much carefully and sensitively. Uh, now, uh, considering the sensitivity, I mean, um, having listened what Anilji has mentioned, and then what could be, I mean, way forward, how can we mitigate the limitations that we, you witnessed actually during that time? And then how to um, is restructure this whole um, rescue relief operation, operational landscape, including government system and then uh, NGO as well as private sector, community organization, where, where to hit most? Uh, could you please, I mean, just uh, respond two, three minutes time? Um, thank you, Chandraji. Um, uh, actually, um, um, the uh, uh, NDRRME is there. As I said that uh, I'm not quite satisfied with the present st structure. Um, uh, it looks like uh, a department of the, under the Ministry of Home Affairs. It is a multi-agency and coordination mechanism. Earlier, there was the uh, Disaster uh, uh, National Disaster Coordination Committee chaired by the Home Minister that uh, we felt uh, insufficient uh, to respond to the major disasters. That's why we came to this new mechanism. And then new mechanism also came in the uh, new avatar of, of same previous one. Previously there was not much structure, now it came in a more structured way, there nothing more. That's why what I think is that we need to improvise it and then uh, uplift this statute as an, under the Prime Minister's uh, office and uh, is an integrated uh, organization for uh, which can coordinate all the ministries, departments, including security agencies first. And then second, there must be a very clear stipulated uh, SOP, standard operating procedures for the people who are supposed to involve in, in, in search and rescue and, uh, and particularly in search and rescue. Relief, we could have a much time. And then for search and rescue, we don't, we don't have much time. Maybe in relief also that a uh, lot of coordinations are needed, but uh, that uh, SOP, very meticulous, very driven SOP of uh, every individual, not only institutions. Going back to them, uh, some responsibility can be assigned to the institution and then institution must have a well-prepared uh, standard operating procedure. And then that book does not, uh, is not sufficient enough that standard operating procedure must be communicated well, and then the, those who are responsible for that must be trained one. Second, and the third one is third is that uh, the Anilji uh, rightly mentioned. Then Kathmandu, uh, we have allocated uh, 80 uh, open spaces 
in case of uh, major disasters. And then that must be clearly protected, communicated to the community. If there is a major disaster and then where they should go. Every household must have a knowledge that where they need to go. And then we must have all the open spaces in Kathmandu like that Biratnagar or Nepal Ganj or Pokhara, all urban areas. Rural areas, there are a lot of open spaces, no need to much more give a focus on that and then um, spend much more time on that. But in rural urban areas, you need to have the open spaces. Uh, people immediately can go and uh, have the, uh, uh, um, in case of that major uh, uh, emergency and then uh, and they can go and, go and get a shelter. And the third is the very essential items, the stock of very essential items. Every year must be replenished because uh, we are one of the most disaster prone country, not only in terms of earthquake, we are one of the vulnerable country in terms of the floods and uh, landslides and the fire equally. And then we need a uh, similar kinds of the uh, relief materials and, uh, and the, uh, uh, that materials must be uh, stored in a, in a regional warehouses as Anilji mentioned that there were some warehouses under construction, but uh, they must be strategically located and then must be uh, very strong resilient uh, on, on any kinds of earthquakes or any kinds of the other, other uh, natural disasters, uh, floods or landslides. And, the, and the, um, another thing is that uh, uh, in case of that uh, um, um, damages of lifelines, particularly the communication, Vitally important, the most important is communication and the water supply. And the uh, people immediately need uh, when they, and then, and the uh, um, sanitations uh, like things. When the people crowd uh, uh, gathers in some places and then not much sanitations, and then there will be a, a danger of immediately there's some kinds of the, uh, um, some health uh, related, uh, some uh, problems may crop up and then that exacerbates the, uh, the disaster related uh, uh, difficulties to handle. That's why uh, there must be some people uh, in emergency to mobilize in emergency, not as a regular, but the, in, there, is a, there are some people uh, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, assign, responsibility assigned to the people in the uh, telecom offices uh, for maintaining their telecom uh, lines. But uh, the, uh, we must have some result. And the, um, for the coordination between NGOs and uh, international ad agencies, and then their role also must be defined. Uh, and when uh, going to the relief, uh, distribution of relief, I strictly avoided to go and uh, individual go and hand over and make a picture and then make a propaganda. This is inhumanity. In, in the name of humanitarian assistance, this is inhuman. They are making a, 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 a kind of the self uh, um, a prophecy for the, in, the, in the name of that uh, people and then making them obliged for providing some kinds of the relief materials. So that is their right to get the right kinds of the relief material in case of emergency. It is not that a kind of the uh, um, personal, uh, gaining personal sympathy of the people, the victim people. That's why the individual going there and uh, distributing must be, must be stopped. And then one, I, I will give you one example and stop it. There was a one team from United States, the Nepalese, uh, uh, non-resident Nepalese. They collected fund there and then came here. And then they wanted to go to distribute relief materials in Russia. And then I asked them that uh, how much um, cost it incurred to distribute the relief material you actually deliver to the remote districts of uh, Russia. And then she said, no, 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 we paid ourselves. We paid ourselves. Our airplane fare, airplane fare we paid, and then we will hire a vehicle, and then we will pay it ourselves, and then it will. It's a, a nonsense thing, no? That they could have that, uh, the, their, their transport expenses, including their vehicle charge for going to Roswa, must have been deposited to the, to the relief fund so that the relief fund can uh, uh, procure materials at uh, the more uh, competitive price and cheaper price collectively, and then distribute by truck loads. They go by taking some five bags of uh, rice, and then that rice cost uh, become 500 rupees per kg. I calculated and short them. This is the 500 rupees per kg, including the cost of their travel. 
that's why this kinds of the uh, extravaganza is must must be stopped as i give you an example of this kabri uh, sindhu palch the whole that uh, the ground that uh, the top ground the most secure place was filled by uh, ngos group of ngos when uh, i asked them cdo to uh, all that evacuate that place and send them back to kathmandu he said that there will be you will cry and then we can do anything uh, and then because they will make a big noise that's yeah. why this is not a clip, uh, sure. place to yeah. that person and so so yeah that's why uh, yeah this is what the coordination is needed and then Thank central you. agency must be needed most Thank authorized you. yeah i think we, we have to reserve one somewhere. full day your one full yeah. day actually to okay. listen okay. uh in we will include also anil ji there and nra will be there most hopefully okay. we will also can invite uh, we will be able to uh, able to invite also home minister so that i mean your uh, lesson will be extremely invaluable to us so uh, sorry for cutting you short um yeah because of time i would like to request uh, our chief executive officer and chair of this session to i mean there is not much time to conclude actually within 3 4 minutes time you do your you try your best <laughs> thank you i will try my best uh, but i will take maybe 2 3 more minutes because this is the launch time and we will take some more time from the launch break uh thank you so much uh, actually uh, the presentations uh, was uh, really comprehensive i would like to congratulate uh, anil ji in this regard and especially uh, lilamuri podel uh, your very very valuable suggestions uh, that has uh, been uh, been uh, given uh, by you and then uh, i think that will be very very useful for anil ji to uh, accommodate and also to revisit uh, the the compendium document that is uh, being prepared um, i think uh, the uh, uh, the uh, some of the points that i i think uh, we have to take uh, maybe uh, all are the valid points that the that we have to uh, consider in the in the preparation of the learning documents but some of the points that i have noted uh, that uh, the Uh, one of the point that the uh, mr nilamani podel has mentioned that the detail activities from the first minute and the first hour second hour third hour and the days and the seven let's say the seventh days are like that that is to be noted down that is to be recorded and on that basis the future uh, the response plan that we can design on this on the on this basis so i think that is very very valid and the because the uh, these sort of the timing uh, may not be available for the future maybe we have to assign a special team for recording this and then the is ramraj has already mentioned that there is also a detailed documentation has been made by the moha i think uh, i haven't been able to look into this in detail so to what extent the details detailing has been made maybe we have to also work on this otherwise this opportunity will be lost and then in the future will be will not be in a situation to 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 have the records of these sort of the experiences and the informations for the future on the basis of which i think ndrm can prepare the standard operating procedure, procedure for the emergency response and the from from um, the beginning uh, from the individual level at the local level local communities to the the, the different level the institutions as as lilamri ji has also mentioned i think uh, in in from this perspective, perspective i think uh, there is a need i think now the ndrrma has been established and one of the point that um, lilamri ji has also mentioned and we are also having the raising different times from the side of the nra as well that this uh, this ndrrma has to be cured certainly it is being chaired by the prime minister this uh, steering committee but the executive board is uh, from the ministry of home affairs uh, the, so that's why there is a need that it is to be to be graduated from the, uh, the existing level to the level of the prime minister and then the is this the nra is being implemented or this uh, uh, this uh, structured i think ndrrma has also to be structured in that line and but along with again the more sort of the autonomy is needed so this is uh, this uh, the, that is the another point and in that regard i think then there will be a coming of this national emergency operation centers the provincial district local and the ward and then the communities i think different level of the hierarchy and the structures can be designed and the and the every individuals will be mobilized through the community levels uh, this emergency operation centers but with the central command from the national emergency operation centers or on the basis of the different level of the disasters uh, if it is the local level if it is the district level uh, on that sort of the framework uh, this sort of the, the operations uh, rescue and re relief uh, upstairs uh, uh, this uh, the operations will be handled so that is the point that i have taken uh, taken i think this uh, company has to also look into this 
Another point that the handling of media is very, very important, and in the uh, uh, and also we have to be safe from the propaganda. How to manage on that? That is another area. Otherwise, the, because of the miscommunications, the things will be deteriorated. Yeah, this uh, uh, in uh, Nepal could do uh, this uh, the manage on that uh, at that time, but it may not happen every time. And then the depends upon the leadership. I think um, the uh, this uh, uh, the uh, the sort of system has to direct on the uh, this uh, this sort of mechanism. So that is very, very important. I think I have uh, noted the another sort of point on this. The next point is the, the uh, in regards to the DRR facilities that uh, to what extent that we have been able to to establish. Uh, Ramraj has mentioned on that uh, till now. Uh, this on the basis of the PDNA, whatever that it has mentioned, I think that is to be evaluated. I think and on the basis of which the program uh, and the and the and the this the development of the DRR facilities uh, sort of the program is to be designed. I think we also have to evaluate, and this paper has also to highlight on that. Another point is very very important is the community's response and the local uh, local response is very very important and then the we also have to have a certain level of documentation in this regard as well and this is also I think to be highlighted in the paper uh, in the, in the uh, document I think this is also another point that we have to also take into consideration. The uh, 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 the uh, 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 in the presentations also uh, the ONLG has mentioned that the uh, the different level of the critical infrastructures. I think this is to be certainly analyzed properly. And the, uh, uh, the for example, uh, uh, this, uh, there is a need of the different level of the simulations. All the modelings is to be made uh, in, in regards to the different level of the earthquake. If, ha if it had happened, what, would, uh, what sort of the, the situation would have been uh, this, uh, this, uh, um, because of that sort of this, the, the, the effect. So uh, let's say if it would have been uh, besides the uh, this on the other days uh, besides the Saturdays, then the situation would have been very very devastating. There is one of the report uh, published from the World Bank. It is more than 20,000 of the school children would have been uh, this uh, this uh, this. We have the the the, the date sort of the record would have been if uh, this uh, it would have been in the daytime. So that is really one of the the major sort of alarming sort of the pictures that are coming up. So we also have to look into that if the magnitude would have been the, in the different levels what would have been uh, the situations again. So uh, these are uh, the actually from the side uh, from the perspective of the the, the major uh, sort of the critical infrastructures we are not having so much difficulties. Let's say the communications telecom network were not affected. Electricity was not in that level of the uh, sort of the Im impact was not in that level, uh, and the other sort of infrastructure was also the not affected. If uh, it would happen in that level, how would have we have to be prepared for that? I think that is also another sort of a point that we also have to look into and then the, be prepared for that uh, for the future. And the uh, sort of the simulations, uh, the the, the modeling uh, would be helping us for for for, uh, for this purpose. Another point certainly, everyone is talking about this the, the high risk location planning or the resettlement planning uh, would also help. But it is uh, not uh, easy as we talk in the in, in being in Kathmandu. The it has to be looked into also from the perspective of the livelihood and the economic sort of the uh, sort of the aspects of the people, the cultural aspect and the social aspect of the people, and it it has to be on the basis of a certain level of awareness campaigning, but at the same time demanding through the community themselves. So through this approach, as the NRA has uh, has already uh, under the process of finalizing the developing almost around 130 numbers of the of the uh, of the uh, integrated settlements that is under the under the final stage of the development i think it will also give a certain level of the lessons for us to design for the future set of relocation plans uh, especially in the landslide prone areas or the flood prone, prone areas that we can we can do in which uh, this i'm happy to to also share that we are already working together with ndrrma in regards to the, the the relocations of the the vulnerable settlements in in Sindhupalchuk and the other districts, uh, the, because of the recent landslides uh, that we are we're working together, and the experts are really been mobilized through the from the side of the NRA as well, and we are working together in this regard. And the, uh, there are some of the points that the queries ha, uh, queries has also been received from the. Uh, 
uh, from the different uh, sort of the uh, comment, these uh, feedbacks from the people, I think that has also been addressed uh, to a certain level. Only uh, I would like to point out the, the Sankar Dakals, uh, which have, uh, you have mentioned the emphasizing on the rock fail, uh, the separately to be to be also looked into. I think that is also uh, quite a valid point. And then the NDRR may certainly we also have to look into this. And then the I think other points have already been uh, been uh, been already addressed. So I would not like to go uh, in detail on that. And the one of the points that has been mentioned from Nigel Fisher that is to to have the emergency insurance facilities for the local subkeepers sub sub and the entrepreneurs so that uh, it will be easy for releasing the goods, their goods to the local population. I think we would like to learn maybe more uh, on sort of the idea that Nigel, you have mentioned here. So uh, uh, with this, uh, uh, considering the constraint of the time, uh, this I, I would like to maybe uh, the close uh, here, but uh, before that, it's, uh, Dr. Chandra has mentioned that I think uh, uh, the, we have to uh, sit together and have a special meeting uh, arrangement with uh, Lila Medi, sir, um, and together with uh, maybe Anilji, you also may be agreeing on that. Uh, we need to have uh, sort of this, uh, the sort of the meeting on this and then design a sort of the, the sort of documentation, sort of the framework. Uh, this how we'll be able to document in all of these lessons that have been learned during this process. Otherwise, we'll be maybe lost uh, this opportunity in the future. We may not be having this uh, sort of opportunity for the future. So this is the right time that we have to uh, this uh, start the recording of all these sort of experiences. And then the, we'll certainly organizing this sort of a meeting uh, later on. Thank you, especially Lila Madisar, for your presence. And then we'll be also meeting again in the another paper that is uh, the governance uh, sort of the compendium that is under the process that we'll be discussing uh, later after this after the launch. So with this, uh, thank you very much, Anilji, uh, your sort of effort uh, having a comprehensive set of presentations. And thank you, uh, Lila Madisar and the Ramraj and the also Bipulji. Uh, this all the commentators and all the participants who have been contributing here. Thank you so much. And then I would like to close this uh, session here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.